तो मैं शुरू करता हूँ कुछ इंट्रोडक्टरी कुछ अपनी बातें रखते हुए सबसे पहले जन सरोकार की तरफ से आप सभी को आमंत्रण है जितने वक्ता हैं और बाकी जितने साथी जुड़े हैं सुनने के लिए अः ये संयुक्त राष्ट्र का जो खाद्य प्रणाली का एक शिकार है तो उसका एक भारत का एक काउंटर डायलॉग यानी एक काउंटर वार्ता या एक शिखर सम्मेलन का ये आयोजन जन सरोकार की तरफ से हो रही है और इसकी आयोजन में अलग अलग संस्थाएं जुड़ी है अलग अलग जन आंदोलनों पूरे देश से जुड़े हैं जो जिनका कृषि और खाद्य पदार्थों से जुड़ाव है और ये दो दिन का कार्यक्रम है और दोनों दिन दो दो सत्र चलेंगे सुबह दो घंटा और दोपहर दो घंटा सुबह uh, ग्यारह से एक चलता है उसके बाद दोपहर तीन से पांच तो आज सुबह भी ग्यारह से एक पहला सत्र चला था अभी ये तीन से पांच चलेगा और ऐसे ही कल भी सुबह ग्यारह से एक और फिर दोपहर तीन से पांच सत्र चलेंगे जो पहला सत्र आज का था वो था कि जो पूरा खाद्य का खाद्य का जो शासन का जो पूरा प्रणाली है उसका कैसे कॉर्पोरेट द्वारा इस पे कब्जा किया गया है और अभी जो ये सत्र है आ, ये कृषि और इसके कृषि करने के अलग अलग क्या विकल्प हो सकते हैं इन चीजों के बारे में हम आज चर्चा करेंगे और आप इस सत्र में जिस तरीके से जुड़े हैं बाकी सत्र के लिए को में भी जुड़ने के लिए यही प्रक्रिया रहेगा जो जूम का लिंक आपने इस सत्र में जुड़ने के लिए आपने प्रयोग किया है बाकी सत्र के लिए भी इसी लिंक का प्रयोग करें और ये सत्र सारे फेसबुक पे भी लाइव स्ट्रीम हो रहे हैं आप फेसबुक पे भी देख सकते हैं और कुछ समय बाद इसका जो वीडियो है एडिट करने के बाद हम यूट्यूब पे भी अपलोड करेंगे अगर आपके कुछ सवाल हैं तो इसमें चैट का ऑप्शन आप एक दूसरे के साथ चैट नहीं कर सकते क्योंकि कई बार कुछ लोग आते हैं अनाप्शन आप उसमें डालते हैं तो चैट का थोड़ा पाबंदी हमने रखा है कुछ सवाल आपके हैं तो सवाल करने का एक अलग क्यू एंड ऑप्शन है वहां पे आप अपना सवाल कर सकते हैं या फेसबुक से आप जुड़ रहे हैं तो वहां पे भी कमेंट में आप अपनी सवाल रख सकते हैं और वहां से हम वक्ताओं को के साथ हम साझा करेंगे और अब वक्ता जब अपनी बात रख रहे हैं तो इन सवालों का भी वो ख्याल में रखते हुए अपने बात रख सकते हैं वक्ताओं से गुजारिश होगी कि वो एक ही भाषा में बात करें क्योंकि जो अनुवाद कर रहे हैं उनको नहीं तो अलग अलग जगह जाके अलग अलग भाषा की अनुवाद करनी होती है तो अगर वक्ता अपनी भाषा बदलते रहेंगे तो जो अनुवाद कर रहे हैं उनके लिए दिक्कत होगी और वक्ताओं से ये भी गुजारिश करेंगे कि वो धीरे बोले मतलब ज्यादा तेज ना बोले ताकि अनुवाद करने में दिक्कत ना हो आ, हर वक्ता के लिए दस मिनट दिया जाएगा और आठ मिनट जब हो जाएंगे तो मैं एक हल्का सा घंटी बजाऊंगा ताकि आपको पता रहे कि आपके पास और दो मिनट बचे हैं और ये जो सत्र है यूएनएफएसएस में आ, अलग अलग जिसको वो कहते हैं एक्शन ट्रैक तो अलग अलग एक्शन ट्रैक है तो ये एक सत्र है जिसका यूएनएफएसएस में नाम दिया गया है बूस्ट नेचर पॉजिटिव प्रोडक्शन यानी प्रकृति को कैसे बढ़ावा देते हुए हम उत्पाद ले सकते हैं तो हम उस पर विचार रखेंगे आज और इसका जो टॉपिक है उससे तो हमारे कोई आपत्ति नहीं है और अगर हम इनके जितने दस्तावेज है ये सब पढ़ेंगे तो लगेगा कि ये तो बहुत अच्छी अच्छी बातें कर रहे हैं तो इसका क्यों विरोध हो रहा है तो बस मैं और दो मिनट में ये थोड़ा बताना चाहूंगा कि आ, हम इसमें हमें इसमें क्यों दिक्कतें नजर आ रही है तो कुछ ठोस उदाहरण के साथ मैं ये बात रखना चाहूंगा सबसे पहले अगर जैसे आ, वो अलग अलग जगह से सुझाव मांग रहे हैं कि आ, आ, प्रकृति को बढ़ावा देते हुए कैसे उत्पादन कर सकते हैं तो सबसे पहले अगर हम ये जो डॉक्यूमेंट है इनका दस्तावेज है तो उसके सबसे पहले पन्ने पे ये लिखा है कि अगर इसमें कोई सुझाव दिया गया है इसका मतलब ये नहीं है कि हम इस सुझाव से सहमत सहमति रखते हैं 
तो अगर सहमति रखते नहीं है तो फिर उसमें क्यों रखा गया है और ऐसे उनको कहना क्यों पड़ रहा है क्योंकि अगर हम देखेंगे इसमें कुछ सुझाव ऐसे भी हैं कि एक सुझाव ये है कि दी जीन आंतरिक बीज का हमें प्रयोग करना चाहिए वो कहते हैं कि आलू को उगाने में बहुत समय लगता है तो इसलिए आलू के जीन के को मैं कुछ बदलाव करके छह महीने की जगह तीन महीने में आलू उग जाए तो इस तरीके के सुझाव हैं और जीन आंतरिक का जो तकनीक है उससे कई लोग इसका विरोध करते हैं क्योंकि एक तो है कि इसमें स्वास्थ्य का असर पड़ सकता है इसमें किसान की को आर्थिक तरीके से इससे दिक्कत हो सकती है बट उसके अलावा पर्यावरण को भी ये काफी नुकसान करता है और जब ये पूरा एक्शन ट्रैक इसी का है कि पर्यावरण को कैसे बढ़ावा दे तो उसमें ये एक सुझाव लेना ही नहीं चाहिए था ऐसे ही बी है या क्रॉप लाइफ है बी तो एक कंपनी है जो कीटनाशक बनाती है जो बेसिकली जहर है और क्रॉप लाइफ भी ऐसे कंपनी का एक संगठन है तो इनके भी सुझाव हम देखते हैं कि इस डॉक्यूमेंट में है या एक इनका सॉइल हब है यानी मिट्टी के बारे में मिट्टी में सुधार कैसे करें इन चीजों पे वहां सुझाव दिया गया है और उसमें एक संस्था है ब्रेक थ्रू इंस्टीट्यूट उनका इसमें एक जो सुझाव दिया है वो ये है कि रासायनिक खाद के फैक्ट्री हमें और बनाने चाहिए अफ्रीका में तो अगर रासायनिक खाद के और फैक्ट्री बनाएंगे तो इसमें प्रकृति का कैसे इसमें सुधार होगा ये कुछ समझ में नहीं आया कि ये सुझाव भी इन्होंने कैसे लिया और इसके पीछे तो इसलिए हम कहते हैं कि इसमें जो पूरा प्रणाली उपयोगी उपयोग किया गया है इसी में दिक्कत है और इसका ये वजह ये भी एक है कि इसमें इसकी जो अध्यक्षता हो रही है जो एक एक तरीके से एक विशेष प्रतिनिधि है यूएनएफएसएस में वो है एक संस्था के अध्यक्ष जिसका नाम संस्था का नाम है आगरा यानी अलायंस फॉर ग्रीन रेवोल्यूशन इन अफ्रीका इसका हिंदी में अगर कहूँ तो एक तरीके से अफ्रीका में हरित क्रांति लाने के लिए एक समन्वय और हरित क्रांति से पर्यावरण का कितना नुकसान हुआ है हमने भारत में तो देख ही रहे हैं और एक तरीके से जो पूरा किसान आंदोलन भी चल रहा है उसकी भी अगर हम जड़ देखें कि इसकी जो समस्या है तो वो भी एक तरीके से हरित क्रांति से ही शुरू हो रहे हैं तो इस वजह से हम ये पूरी प्रक्रिया का निंदा कर रहे हैं और ये एक तरीके से मैं थोड़ा एक पृष्ठभूमि रखना चाह रहा था और इसी के साथ आज के सत्र का अध्यक्षता दिनेश जी कर रहे हैं दिनेश अब्रोल जो नेशन फॉर फार्मर्स से जुड़े हैं तो मैं दिनेश जी से अनुरोध करूंगा कि वो अपनी शुरुआती अपने बातें रखें और फिर हम इस सत्र को आगे ले जाएं दिनेश जी फाइन थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच फ्रेंड्स स्पीकर्स हैव ऑलरेडी ज्वाइंड अस आई कैन सी कनायन आई कैन सी जबंधिया जी आई कैन सी डॉक्टर सोम माला एंड मेनी मोर फ्रेंड्स उषा सागरी and uh, a welcome on my Namaste. behalf as well uh, a, a, uh i i'll i can talk both in hindi and english but i think uh, let me uh, start with the english and later see so that i i don't create difficulties for the interpreters so friends uh, today in the morning session i don't know how many of you were there uh, what we learned was that uh, yes the process has been very undemocratic opaque non transparent and it has been captured by corporates uh, yes if it uh, the second uh, point that came out cross uh, very clearly that these structures are going to continue and uh, in fact in some ways these structures are in place uh, already in uh, within the uh, 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 indian economy as uh, already in the in case of indian agriculture in fact the three laws that uh, we have seen being promulgated have been precisely uh, 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 undertaken by the government to help the corporates to build their control over the agricultural value chains some of the agricultural value chains that you are familiar with had the participation of the public sector had uh, though in in the case of public sector also there have been uh, issues with regard to way the nature uh, Uh, conservation resource conservation has been handled and uh, correctly so many of those particular points would come up for discussion here 
and uh, it, but the uh, fact that uh, corporates have taken over uh, the control over the agricultural value chains has uh, a set of implications that we need to discuss what are those implications in uh, 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 you know your view your mind like i will give you a small example of karnal which is a green revolution area and uh, i am uh, at the moment i am uh, exploring uh, what has been the impact of the buyers uh, uh, integrated solutions because they are selling uh, maize seeds as well as uh, 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 agrochemicals uh, in use for, and they are producing silage uh, and building a whole agricultural value chain and so there is an integration taking place some of the large farmers have joined uh, uh, already bear and uh, on one hand one side and other side nestle and it is interesting that they are able to aggregate uh, small farmers as well so uh, there there is a, a new set of relations in mix the resource use is uh, uh, undergoing a change uh, in in this area uh, the use of agrochemicals uh, has been in this area taken note of both with regard to use of child labor earlier as well as with regard to the residues being left in soil and water apart from the fact that uh, a lot of water has been also extracted in this particular area and uh, a lot of problem with regard to soil salinity alkalinity all have been also faced in this uh, field uh, area and there has been an attempt to actually see that if crop rotation systems can undergo change but with the corporates coming in the possibilities of uh, really transforming uh, uh, you know or restructuring uh, a, a cropping system uh, is, is becoming certainly an issue and a difficult issue and so uh, locally communities are uh, not going to remain uh, united in the sense of uh, you know they will have different attitudes depending on what benefits uh, they are receiving from the agricultural value chain so uh, whether it is for the food justice movement or for the food sovereignty movement there is a challenge i just taken an example to build a case that the problem is already there in the field the question is how as movements we are going to address it what kind of demands uh, we must place what kind of alternatives do we place so as actually uh, the control can be resisted control can be contested in practice because at the global level there is a multi stakeholderism we learned that uh, uh, unequal partners are being asked to participate as if uh, you know they are equal when when it is not the case and this is being facilitated by our own governments simultaneously uh, we realize that in these places uh, uh, that the uh, small farmers organizations or even our medium scale farmers organizations do not have any place in those uh, even in our own national dialogues they did not have a place so even the national dialogues which are going on what kind of priorities did they take up they have not Uh, have an engagement with that this government has uh, yet to make make an effort saying the kind of proposals which are coming up there what is with what what kind of um, uh, engagement farmers uh, uh, want with the, those particular solutions would have to be discussed so this is an occasion today that where we engage with the this uh, process through a counter dialogue which we are trying to establish we express our views we should uh, uh, give our own priorities uh and uh, uh, what we think are the po- uh, possible nature positive solutions in our own case be in the green revolution areas or in rain fed areas or in uh, 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 even in uh, systems like agro pastoral systems or how do uh, 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 if the corporates continue the way they are thinking of nature positive solutions Uh, would we be able to integrate crop and livestock system which is absolutely becoming essential if we are really wanting resource conservation technologies to emerge or crop diversification to take place so what are our own uh, 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 priorities and agendas for the nature positive solutions those suggestions could also be put here as far as it's concerned so how we are going to uh, engage at the global level as well as at the national level i think uh, in the context of agriculture and nature positive suggestion the uh, speakers whom we have lined up they are very distinguished 
workers, both from the side of the movements as well as uh, the friends who have come from the academic world. Uh, uh, not taking more time in terms of uh, uh, context setting, I think these are minimum remarks I have tried making. But on the way, as the uh, uh, discussion progresses, conversation takes up, uh, 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 we will uh, uh, add more elements, more dimensions. Friends, the first speaker that uh, we have uh, with us is from a movement. And uh, Kanayan is very much with us. And uh, I think I have not taken more than 10 minutes. I hope Nachike, uh, fine. I, uh, I was rushing it. And I don't know whether friends could translate me uh, 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 and interpret uh, uh, appropriately. But uh, I'm sure uh, uh, most of the friends here also understanding uh, English. And I know friends from all parts of the uh, country that, uh, are around with us who understand English. So, Kanayan, uh, your 10 minutes now. So, you know the agenda, you know the context. Yeah. Thanks, Sudhinesh Ji. Thank you very much for um, this opportunity. Uh, I would like to introduce myself to you a little elaborately uh, for the benefit of other people who do not know about me and my engagements. So I'm part of uh, Tamil Nadu Farmers Association, and which is a member organization of La Via Campesina. And at national level, you are all aware that there is Indian Coordination Committee of the Farmers Movements. They have a certain chapter like uh, South Indian Coordination Committee of the Farmers Movements. I'm serving as the General Secretary of the South Indian Coordination Committee of the Farmers Movements. Via Campesina, uh, a global um, uh, farmers movement where I have been deputed uh, to uh, carry out works related to Rome process. We call it Rome process because the organizations, United Nations organizations based in Rome, uh, which including Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, uh, Committee on the Food Security of the United Nations, uh, World Food Program, where we did very less work and uh, International Fund for Agriculture Development, EFAT. So I frequented to uh, Rome to participate in uh, the meetings of the Committee on Food Security. We have a civil society mechanism where small scale producers, uh, indigenous people, uh, youths, women, kind of different uh, cross-cutting uh, constituencies are uh, together formed civil society mechanism to engage uh, with the committee on the uh, food security of the United Nations. So the committee on food security of the UN is a very inclusive uh, place where farmers are able to go there, indigenous people are able to go there and um, um, raise their voice and they have a say in the policy making of the institution. Even though we do not, civil society mechanism uh, uh, is not having the voting right on par with the, the, the member countries, but we have equal participation right in the discussions. We can speak um, equally uh, with the United States, so India, Pakistan, uh, Canada, or any country. So this is a very good example of uh, how uh, a UN organization uh, should function. Uh, but this food system summit, which has completely uh, um, bypassed uh, the CFS, completely not taking uh, the, the FAO. FAO is also uh, having a very inclusive process. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we have the say, FAO often consulting with the civil society organizations, governments, when they are consulting the governments in the regions and we are also there and we are raising our voice, we are participating in the discussions. So this food system summit is totally different. This is totally hijacked uh, by uh, the corporate, uh, 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 co corporates, I can say like that. And World Economic Forum uh, is, uh, play, playing a major role there, and and this system summit, uh, food system summit, is happening in the name of the farmers, for the farmers. They claim, but 
there is no space uh, uh, for the food producers there. This is an agenda uh, to, to increase, uh, to fast track the already happening uh, corporatization in, in the agriculture. So corporatization in agriculture is happening in different uh, countries in different forms. If you look at India, I, I come to India. I just uh, given you an outline in how it was bypassed and how there is inclusive systems are there in CFS and it is not there in the in the UNFSS. If you look at India, I'm a very small farmer. Uh, there are many uh, millions and millions of farmers here are how corporatized. The land is there still with farmers or land is leased by someone. I have a leased land in Karnataka from where I'm talking to you. Land is there, the farmer is there, uh, but the control is there with the corporates. How? Agriculture inputs, companies like uh, uh, plant protection companies and all those uh, companies, they are controlling the farmers. And you have to uh, buy seeds, you have to buy uh, chemicals, you have to buy know-how, you, you have to keep paying for them. This is what happening. And the recent very worrying trend is that uh, there are mega mergers of the big transnational corporations. Already there are fewer corporations and DuPont and Dow Chemicals came together. They have consolidated that power. Chem China is acquired it is the European major company, Syngenda, is now with, with, uh, with, uh, with Chem China. Chem China is already having uh, a large chunk of money uh, shares in the Adama company. They have close to 50% of the market share in the generic uh, uh, generic uh, ag agrochemicals in India. And similarly, uh, uh, Bayer Corporation has acquired uh, Monsanto. Now Monsanto is Bayer. So this is how very few uh, big corporations, they have come together. There is less innovation uh, among them. I have been listening to those uh, macroeconomists who are supporting the capitalistic uh, kind of uh, economy. We are always saying that if there are many people and there will be competition and there will be a lot of uh, 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 space for innovation and you will be getting many more uh, pro products and farmers will benefit. But this is not exactly happening here. We have written uh, to the government of India's Competition Commission of India uh, opposing the merger of the uh, Bayer Monsanto in India, but we, do, we did not even receive a response from them. This is how it happened. The Sumitomo Chemicals from Japan has already acquired a company in India. So this is a corporate rush is now uh, how to uh, take over the generic, um, uh, uh, generic uh, companies in India and also uh, concentrating power among themselves. So every small farmer who is, for example, potato cultivation uh, in my place, the farmer has to uh, spend not less than 20 or 25,000 rupees for crop protection chemical, chemicals in order to uh, protect potatoes from uh, late blight and, 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 and the pest, uh, the army worm and other Yes. Dinesh Ji is one of the champions in the in the fight against uh, IPR um, uh, IPRs uh, against the farmers. And here now the corporations are enjoying longer period of um, uh, time uh, for their new innovations and highly priced. So this is how farmers are used and. Few days back, there is a journalist who called me from Bloomberg, and she was asking me, uh, "What is our position? What is our response to the government of India, which has already decided to hand over data collected uh, uh, about uh, data collected about the agriculture and 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 farmers to to the private companies?" She was asking me. This is one of the biggest debate which is happening all over the world and the big data collection and the big data transfer to the big corporations uh, so that they can very easily 
uh, reach out to the small and marginal farms all over the world. But some part of the country, I've been to Brazil, I have been to Argentina, where the companies can have millions of hectares of land, they can do agriculture, they can harvest, they can process, they can sell it. Uh, okay, I will finish in one minute. But in India, we are still farmers staying in our farms, but we are remotely controlled by the farmers. Our pocket is directly um, uh, uh, squeezed by the corporations. In this context, these three farm laws came. Immediately after this farm laws uh, came, it was Prime Minister Narendra Modi who said that this will help foreign companies to come to India and invest. There, everything uh, is very clear that these laws were brought to whose benefit. And, and a final word I would like to say that uh, this is uh, corporate control is not a very new thing. And it since 1990s, uh, since the inception of the WTO and many forms of controls over the farms uh, from intellectual property rights uh, uh, to the free trade and, and, and in, in, in flow of the, the, the cheaper imports from, uh, our, from other countries, which destroys the local production, local uh, market, and, and we are being uh, asked to compete uh, with those people who are control is going to be a very big problem. So that is what UNFSS is facilitating. Over to you. Thanks. Any questions? I would love to respond. Uh, Anandji, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, you brought up uh, uh, the issue of uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, during this particular uh, period of 2000 to, uh, to 2015 itself, uh, by Monsanto, Bayer, Dodd, Syngenta, DuPont, BSF, there have been 151 co companies uh, acquired in the case of uh, seeds. Uh, about uh, uh, 11 companies in the case of biopesticides and totally 35 companies in the area of pesticides. So, and if I count agreements, it's almost a double of uh, acquisitions and agreement together need to be counted. So there is a huge concentration taking place. Market power is growing. And outflow on account of this, if I uh, uh, really share with you, uh, a, 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 even if we go the uh, go to period in uh, 2000s uh, early, there was a deficit of uh, 470 million uh, rupees in the case of Bayer, Dupont in the case of 2180 uh, th thousands of millions of rupees uh, deficit. Monsanto was about 102 at that time. Syngenta was about 4181, and you said Syngenta and ChemChina have merged, which is a dama. You pointed that out. But if you come to now the 2012-17 period, because I was advising the Competition Commission on this, uh, I, I, we brought it out that the outflow, the deficit, meaning there is less earning and more outflow out of the country drain. And if you remember the colonial period, Dada Bhai Naroji wrote a book called The Drain Theory. And that's how actually the Congress uh, got activized as far as it's concerned at that time because there was outflow taking place That's uh, to Britain and Britain was building colonies elsewhere. And uh, the outflow during this particular period uh, uh, was uh, four times of what was in the case of 2006-11 period. So uh, actually increasing really exponentially virtually uh, 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 that outflow has been uh, the case. Uh, so the nation is losing. They are importing chemicals now. And uh, uh, they have no extension system on the ground. They do not even tell the workers and farmers how to use those particular chemicals. And uh, I will build on the, this more where, as and when there are more uh, uh, presentations made and tell how actually incomes are also getting divided. Who is gaining? Who is losing? That analysis is needed so that the people can be educated. The next speaker, Nachiket, who should be, Ramu also has joined. I can see Dr. Raman Janelu also has joined. And he's been working on the alternatives. No, if Ramu, if you would like to go next, is that okay? 
Ramu, Dr. Raman Janelu, uh, Dr. Ramu, uh, please, Ramu, yes. uh, really welcome. Really. Thank yeah. you for joining. Yeah. Ramu has worked uh, hugely on non pesticide management, what alternatives can be put in place. And I'm expecting his uh, presentation will show us uh, all, uh, the way forward on the alternatives as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, I'll go through the. Uh, the current uh, how uh, and what kind of support is available for uh, farmers to move towards organic and natural farming in this country. Uh, certainly, I think uh, one of the key uh, thing we need to uh, uh, see is across the country there is an acceptance towards transition. I think uh, that is uh, that is becoming very very clear in the last ten years. I would say uh, from two thousand four uh, when. Initially, we began talking about NPM organic and all. In the states, not much support was there. But uh, in the last uh, 10 years, there is a significant transition which has happened. They may call it with various names. Uh, whether they call it as uh, natural farming, they call it as organic farming, permaculture, sustainable agriculture, ZBNF. Uh, while much of them are uh, through activism movements and then uh, uh, networks like OFI kind of thing, uh, a policy and program driven approach began uh, 10 years back. I would say 10, 2004 is what uh, uh, the, a policy and program driven approach towards uh, more organic and natural farming has began. And uh, there are various schemes uh, across the country. And then some states have taken very positive steps and then there is a lot of learning which we can take up uh, uh, in, uh, in taking it forward. Another very important dimension which is being discussed uh, is about climate change. So the mitigation, from a mitigation point of view, reducing energy use, chemical use and water use in agriculture is absolute necessary and that's a, there is a realization at the near at least in certain quarters. So that is something which is also pushing for this change. It's not just about uh, safe food or uh, farmer's welfare. Markets and uh, climate change, these two are becoming uh, very important because methane and nitrous oxide emissions mostly are from agriculture. Nearly about 78% comes from agriculture. We were just making a calculation. This is a contribution of uh, uh, these greenhouse gas emissions uh, from paddy in Telangana. And uh, to offset the kind of what kind of uh, uh, offset measures are required, I think it's absolutely impossible even to offset if we continue the same amount of damage uh, by using more chemicals and uh, more water. So the, the, it's about uh, 100 million tons of carbon emissions we calculated from the paddy cultivation in Telangana. It has grown by 200 percent in Telangana in the last uh, last seven years, and fertilizer use almost. Uh, has uh, increased by 45 40, 45 percent and today we are the one of the largest fertilizer use uh, in the country so this 100 million tons is equivalent to nearly about 21 million cars traveling for one year so you can imagine the kind of pollution all this is causing so the transition towards organic and natural farming uh, while it is catching up Today, we have nearly about uh, under certified organic, it is about 33.78 lakh hectares. And uh, also, there is a large area which is uncertified. So, that is also growing significantly. So, when we look at markets, also it is growing significantly. In fact, last one year, 2021, 2019-20, uh, if you look at last two years, it is growing at 50% per annum. Uh, so that's a significant growth, both domestic as well as international market is growing significantly. And uh, we are expecting to reach out to, and this would be almost doubling in the next two, four years. So all this is pushing more and more farmers, uh, uh, rather pushing it is actually attracting more and more farmers to towards uh, organic and natural farming. So at the national level, there is a plan now to make uh, FPOs who are into organic production and then create a federation of those FPOs at the state level and then the national level. So that's a plan. Uh, so as part of the new 10,000 FPO scheme, they're going to have about 1,000 FPOs which are into complete organic production. So this is one uh, major initiative in this country. And uh, from the Department of Agriculture side, there are uh, two major schemes. One is called as the PKVY, Paramparagat Krishivikas Yojana, which is a cluster-based 
PGS certified domestic market based program and uh, this program uh, is aiming at uh, aiming at reaching out to nearly about 17 lakh hectares into organic in the next uh, uh, 5 years and then it's about uh, 2400 clusters in a value chain mode and then these clusters are five villages each and uh, in addition there are about 4 lakh hectares of traditional large area and 1 lakh uh, hectares of individual farmers so this is a uh, core focus of the pkvy program in this country and uh, there is also a new pro initiative as part of the pkvy program which is a large area clusters and this is about every farmer who is part of this program will get about 8000 rupees per hectare over five years period so 2000 per hectare first three years and uh, 1000 per hectare for the next two years this is to help the transition so in the tra till now one of the major constraint was about during the transition period uh, there is a suspicion about uh, yield drop and also farmer has to organize his, their own resources so the uh, by calculating the amount of fertilizer subsidy which may go for individual farmer this was arrived at so it's about 8000 per hectare per a period of five years so that is the support which is available under pkvy program this mission and uh, organic and value chain development in the northeastern region movcd uh, uh, ner is what is called and uh, this is uh, largely uh, largely focused on uh, third party certification export oriented and uh, supporting end to end kind of thing the target is to reach about 1.5 lakh hectares uh, and to covering 2 lakh farmers and uh, build about uh, 300 fvos uh, which are commodity based and then uh, interesting part of this is also about setting up 300 uh, food production farmer interest groups uh, among these fvos uh, particularly catering to the organic farming needs in the northeastern region so this is a budgets are which are available as part of the government of uh, india's pkvy program and another interesting thing is also uh, government uh, is trying to tie up with various ongoing initiatives one is a namami gange initiative which is on the banks of ganga river so they are trying to transform uh, on either side of the ganga river into only organic so they are trying to discourage the entire chemicals and then uh, trying to shift towards organic so the plan is to about reach uh, 1 lakh hectares uh, around these things and then create market for the produce and uh, after this all controversies about jbnf uh, organic farming and other things government now trying to define it as bharatiya prakriti krishi paddhati india natural farming so any practice uh, which is chemical free and which uses natural uh, on farm products is uh, uh, is okay for to be part of any program so they call it as bharatiya prakriti krishi paddhati not uh, with any any specific name and another initiative which began uh, which began now is a uh, certification of contiguous areas so if uh, entire village is into organic so the, the farmers can uh, through the panchayat, they can file a letter and then uh, with a letter from the Department of Agriculture, this entire village can come for uh, uh, under certification and they, they're easy way of uh, certification. So there's a new initiative which has begun and there is also support available for the farmers under this one. And uh, for formation of uh, FPOs and uh, particularly the organic farming, etc. So these are the kind of uh, support which is available. So all these programs have about uh, uh, seventy-eight thousand five eight thousand rupees uh, per head over a period of uh, three years, plus uh, technical support, plus uh, infrastructure support. So broadly, that is the support which is available under these programs. And uh, so whether it is a third party certified or uh, whether it is a PKV, it is a PGS certified. So that's a support which is available. And for value addition, uh, near, there is a government of India has began uh, a program called as uh, 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 micro food processing units. So that I, I'll talk about it. So under that, there is also a scheme which is available for uh, uh, for this. So nearly about uh, 25 to 30 lakhs uh, will be available for each uh, FPO for moving towards organic and then establishing the processing units and all. 
like you mentioned earlier about uh, large scale transformation it's about uh, 5 lakh hectares is what is the target and uh, they get support uh, 2000 per hectare and first three years and then 1000 rupees per hectare on the fourth and fifth year so this is for the every hectare in the village so if the entire village gets transformed uh, this is the support which is available under this program so this is for the northeast uh, in the northeast uh, it's about 6000 per hectare is available for uh, uh, capacity building and uh, certification and hand holding and then for farmers uh, for making their own inputs or uh, buying the inputs it's about 15000 rupees per hectare for uh, 3 to 5 years like i mentioned earlier it is about 8000 rupees in the plains in the northeast region it is about 15000 rupees in addition there are support for seeds uh, uh, seeds uh, seed storing warehouse building and transportation of the vehicle with about 90% subsidy these are certain things which are available and uh, of course this is a post harvest infrastructure which is available at 75% subsidy in the northeast region and this is important and interesting. Uh, this scheme is available for farmers who are not part of any of these projects. So if farmer is not part of any of because many times what is happening is these projects are run by the department or by the NGOs or by certain uh, uh, departments in the government program and others are not having access. So any farmer who is not having access to any of these programs can directly approach the National Center for Organic Farming and then there is an assistance available. Uh, for the 8,000 rupees per hectare for five years, this transition support is available. So this is uh, through the state government, which is available, but uh, this is available for the farmers who are not part of any project. And uh, under the micro food enterprises, now government of India has uh, redefined the micro enterprises. Earlier, it was about uh, uh, enterprises with less than 25 lakhs investment and uh, uh, were considered for uh, micro enterprises, now it is increased to one crore. So one crore investment and less than five crore turnover are called uh, micro enterprises and you don't need uh, uh, any big documentation. If you have a GST and then if you are the registered with uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Industries under uh, Ujjam, uh, you'll be eligible for this. And under this, uh, about uh, 35% you get as a subsidy uh, and then 15% is the margin which uh, a farmer or an entrepreneur or an FPO has to bear and uh, remaining 50% comes as a loan and uh, uh, interesting part of this is uh, this plan preparation and then hand in support for making the detailed project report and implementation will also come from the government. So the, the, the state level food processing society will facilitate this process and uh, so maximum subsidy this 35% is maximum about 10 lakhs which means you can go up to about 40, 45 lakhs uh, project cost uh, with this uh, kind of budget. Along with this, FPOs and SSG groups also have a support of about 4 lakh rupees, which they can apply and get as a seed capital. So broadly, these are the schemes uh, and support which is available. Uh, but in addition, there are few more uh, schemes which began at the state level. So I'm, I'm not uh, uh, mentioning all that because uh, in many states, there are small schemes which are available. You can also talk to the Department of Agriculture and get, but largely state schemes are all based on the central assistance which is available. Yeah, I'll stop here. Thank you. If anybody wants more information, they can always connect to me. I can share all this information. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, Ramu, you'll have to uh, now stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, we have heard from Ramu uh, a set of uh, uh, schemes that promote organic farming. But I, uh, I but I have a set of questions which uh, uh, he he is very much aware of that the difference between agroecological approaches and uh, mere input change, as far as is concerned, from. Uh, so there are a variety of challenges that we face on the ground in terms of uh, a building uh, a ecological security or nature positive solutions uh, uh, as well. So maybe uh, he will come back on that issue and uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, let's hear others. Najiket, uh, who's, who's going to be the next speaker? Yeah. Uh, Professor Rajeshwari Raina is here now and I think the technical issues are sorted. So maybe she could go next. 
Thank you. Thanks, Nishiket. I will. I will try and speak with. Um, I probably will turn off my video if the if the connection gets disturbed again. But I was I was thrown out every five minutes from this. this sorry, Raji. Sorry, Raji. Sorry. No, I I don't know what's happening. It's just, I just finished the class and it went well. So you know, until three o'clock. Um, thank you very much for for giving me this opportunity to speak to well farmers and farm movements. Um, I can see Vijay Javandiyaji on this. Um, Dinesh, all of you. Um, thank you. Um, now um, I I actually want to want to just well, let's say focus on this UN food summit and the, the national level planning exercises that we're doing. Right? Um, why are we doing this? I mean, so I'll just build on this. On this this one one particular formulation that they have that the agency of the small farmer yeah the agency of the farmer yeah what does agency mean it means that you have well some independent or let's say relatively independent well idea of where you want to go and also the ability to go there that is I mean if I want to give do farming and uh, cultivate what I want to cultivate, which is what is what my land and water systems are suitable for. I have the ability to do that, yeah, and I also have the ability to earn a living, to keep my family well fed, yeah, to keep my children in school, to pay for some health services. In other words, the ecological, social, and economic decisions are in my hands if I'm a farmer. Now, unfortunately, this this term building agency, uh, it's now coming out, it's sounding like a dole now. That is, acha, inko bhi thoda sa agency de dete, yeah? The farmers, poor guys, let's give them some agency. Now, that's not the way agriculture is done, yeah? Agriculture, ever since we started as a species cultivating land, the farmer and the people who work in the farm have used what David Ludden calls their ecological, that is, there is an ecological reality that they've worked with and that ecological and social systems have been conditioned with a very substantive knowledge of that system. Unfortunately, the erasure of that knowledge, erasure of the agency of that knowledge and of the body of the farmer and his, well, family, that bodies that are working there, the erasure of their knowledge and agency is one of the first things that we've done especially in the agricultural sciences and this whole range of state support systems that we work with now. Now, agroecology as a set of alternatives embodying well, the local ecosystems reality, nature positive as the Dinesh called it. Well, a farmer would never want to kill his soil and water systems knowingly. A farmer who has really has agency will make sure actually when I mean agency, the real ability to act in ways that sustain the soil and water systems and his life and livelihoods and family and all that would never consciously kill his land and water systems, right? So what are we talking about here? Why is the UNFSS document and, you know, I mean, and our government of India meetings that happened in April, why are they giving agency, building agency? Of farming? What, is, what is happening now? Where did that agency go? Yeah. Now, it has gone, unfortunately, to something that we have been fed on. We've all been spoon-fed on this, and right from our, well, what do you say, right from our school days, yeah? Structural transformation, development, yeah? Um, well, value-added increase in productivity of labor. I mean, these are all things that we've been fed. But when they say, when, when they, as in economics, when development economics teaches us about value-added per unit of labor, they're not actually talking about this agency of a knowledgeable, well, substantive knowledge that a farmer has and the farm family has and the way they work in their systems, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about the wage income that you will earn, which is, well, getting somewhere close to the wage income that a factory worker will earn. In other words, somebody who has already been moved out of land-based, agricultural-based, rural livelihoods and into factory production systems, when you when when the labor productivity curves meet, yeah, of both agriculture farm and non-farm, that is where we want to get, right? In other words, the structural transformation of moving people out of agriculture and into industrial and service sector jobs, yeah, um, that is the ideal. That is what the government wants, not just the government of India. All the governments wanted. 
Yeah, whether it was China, Russia, US, I mean, they all wanted Cuba is perhaps the only exception, a very intelligent and stable and sustainable exception, where agriculture is seen as a knowledge based bioeconomy, which works well, and with works with respect towards that local knowledge. Yeah, how do they do that? This is where our understanding of alternatives has to come in. The World UNFSS documents, unfortunately, uh, read like a chorus with what Peter Timmer calls a world without agriculture. Yeah, because ultimately, value added in agriculture in the basic, you know, primary production has to be dwindling down and should ideally in the economic development model should dwindle down, it should peter down, people and their well, and their work in agriculture should also be minimal. That is, you should move people and value added out of agriculture. That is what development economics teaches us. So when we think of alternatives, thinking about alternatives, let's say, like alternatives that are eco-friendly, alternatives that are nature positive, these are all important. But if we locate them in the same paradigm and we can compare, let's say, yield per hectare, yeah, with within these systems, like the HLPE document of the of the FAO has done, yeah, um, we are making a mistake. We are pulling well two different structures into the same little indicator of yield per hectare. Yeah, my teacher, Professor Vaidnathan, um, who's no more, has a beautiful table which says, let's not look at yield per hectare. Let's look at yield per hectare per mm of water. Yeah. The rain for agriculture states in this country, he points out data from five different states. It's in his book, 2010 book. But he says these states have a higher productivity yield per hectare per mm of water compared to the irrigated agriculture states, which is Punjab, Haryana, Western Uttar Pradesh, the Krishna Godavari Belt, and so on, right? How is it possible? Maybe yes, it's a low, lower denominator that the denominator is, is pretty low in the in the case of rain for agriculture because the supply of water is low. But it's also because he says the farmer's intelligence in soil moisture management, the farmer's effort in keeping these crops and, and, and well systems productive is also going into that drop of water. Yeah. So unless we count and value the farmer, not just as a grain producer or a, or a fiber producer, but as somebody as who's a knowledgeable actor, you're not going to get anywhere in terms of even comparing the existing alternatives. If you compare the alternatives using the same lens of productivity per hectare or rupees of value added I mean, per hectare, whatever you want to, you're not going to get there because we are, we are talking about alternatives in the same lens where in a world where we are all being pushed to a world without agriculture, as Peter Timmer calls it, yeah, structural transformation should lead to minimal people living off the land in agriculture, minimal value added that comes to the economy from agriculture. We're not getting to a sustainable system, not just a sustainable agricultural system. We are getting to a complete collapse of the entire economic system. Now, this is why we need an alternative framing, a different framing of well, not just alternatives in agriculture, but an alternative framing of the relationship between agriculture and the economy. Now, what is that? Yeah. Now, um, uh, uh, Nachiket, can I take another uh, two minutes? For, uh, what's the time that I have? Raji, you take, uh, but uh, uh, wrap up in two minutes. Yeah. yeah. Two minutes? Okay. Okay. In, in the economics, that is, in the economics of the role of agriculture in development, yeah, what is given to us is actually Bruce Johnston, um, um, the Johnston and Miller book, you know, the, the famous thing, where they say, you know, you produce, your agriculture has to produce for the domestic economy, agriculture has to produce for the global economy, that is, the international trade, right, to bring foreign exchange. Agriculture should also produce for 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 what what they call you know um, rural cash income yeah for the for, for the for the local produce uh, local producers why to buy more industrial products there goes now you say well what if we have agroecology or let's say organic agriculture which buys from local markets from local systems produces farms the farms inputs in the in the farm itself right what if external inputs are not needed that's one leg that you're just cutting off from the literature that is given to us of agriculture for economic development. Yeah, Market contribution and product contribution of agriculture through this factor contribution where labor and its value is not recognized, but labor is seen as just, you know, number of work hours, not intelligence. Yeah, 
not the skill and knowledge of the farmer. The economic theorization of the role of agriculture in development has to change for alternatives to work. And the UNFSS is unfortunately located in the mainstream developmental thinking based on an unfortunately narrow, very narrow thinking of the economy as a relationship between production and consumption, where ecosystems, that is, it is politically cleansed and it is ecologically cleansed. So there is a kind of, you know, ethereal economy rolling around somewhere up, up there, and that's what we are buying into. We have so many alternatives in this country, so many alternatives within rainforest agriculture, which have the substantive knowledge, which are running on what, what we call the knowledge-based bioeconomy principles, but no external input. Yeah, there is, no, there is no need to produce more so that you can buy more of industrial input. That's not the, that's not the model. We're saying we have natural systems that can actually feed your your land, your water systems, and keep your production system going well. Your consumption is also based on local, locally consumed seasonal foods. That is a healthy way to be. And that is a healthy way to healthy, not just for us as human beings, but also for the environment, right? So why are we in this in this mode? The the last point that I have, Dinesh, is that agriculture, the so-called, I mean, I heard a bit of what Ramo was saying. The, you know, the reason why the state invests so much in agricultural production is not for the farmer. That's one of the biggest lies that we've been fed on. K. N. Raj said this in the 1970s, right? That this, the, the poor farmer is the, is the face that the state shows. But actually what the state is supporting is a range of middle-income actors who are these, well, who are the ones who gain from the supply syndrome of the state. Yeah? Now, why do we need them? The farming sector doesn't need them. It's a state that needs to sustain these actors and their incomes. And now these actors will be the first ones to be thrown out. Yeah. Now they are not even aware of what's happening today. That is a so-called middle layer the state that thrive on the state's subsidies. Whether it is a subsidized dip irrigation system or subsidized bag of fertilizer, they're all the same class that lives off the state's subsidies. And now the corporates, when they take over, once they, they make it all a uniform production system, yeah, 6,000 hectares of oil palm plantations where there were pristine forests in Nagaland. Now, once they take over, there's that entire system that is this whole class will be wiped out. They don't need, the, the state and the corporates don't need them. We're talking about a system that, that actually has potential, but we're glued to a whole range of economic thinking and a, an international economic thinking, which we are happily buying into. The government of India, Indian farmers, we have so many alternatives, so many rich ecologically and socially sustainable ways of agricultural production consumption, but we have to think about it in an alternative framework of the economy and polity, not just alternative agricultural practices. That is not enough anymore. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Raji. Number of important points you have made, and uh, I'm sure uh, conversation in the uh, uh, you know at the last session or the last part of the session. Uh, is going to be around very many of these issues which you have raised as well as uh, uh, because since I uh, wanted you to get two minutes but as a result I'm not going to make a comment because I have lost my two, <laughs> one minute and I'm half a minute. Uh, I want Nachiket to call the next uh, person uh, a, a, a speaker Nachiket uh, so that we, uh, we are able to do time management as well. Yeah, yeah if we could have uh, Usha go next. Uh, as for the schedule, and then followed by Dr. Som Marla, Murugamma, and then Vijayji. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dinesh. Welcome, Usha. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I think uh, I will take lesser, less time so that uh, more time can be given to other speakers because um, the previous speakers, uh, Dr. Ramu as well as uh, Rajeshwari, have explained the whole scenario. Uh, especially on the alternatives and then uh, the nature positive solutions uh, and the way the country is going ahead. And uh, it, it did not happen uh, by itself. It, it happened because of uh, work, discussions, reflections and experimentation by various groups all over the country. Now, starting from, I remember uh, when I was a student of agriculture, 
uh, we had the uh, the biggest tragedy the bhopal tragedy in india and that triggered a lot of thinking among various kinds of people in this country especially the academics uh, and also doctors and uh, agricultural experts and the activists and we had a big campaign against uh, uh, the uh, the company so this uh, that and, and in especially in kerala sitting in kerala i remember we had boycott a lot of boycott campaigns of these products like uh, sevin or the pesticide as well as uh, their batteries then soaps and it triggered a different thinking in 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 kerala to revive a different we we, re, we realized that unless the people have control over the production uh, the full chain the starting from production to consumption it is very very it is going to be difficult and that is proven uh, again and again in all this last at least uh, last 3 4 decades of uh, more and more corporatization of uh, different sectors especially agriculture agriculture i am not going to the details because the pesticides the fertilizers the seeds the latest one is a seed everything is controlled by uh, the the corporates whether, whether it is the indian corporates or the international corporates and they are uh, they work together and uh, as uh, i always remember uh, dr namalwar from tamil nadu the who is the he is no more he always tell you no know, everybody benefited from green revolution except the farmers so that is that is continuing even now you no know, because samu was talking about the growth of agroecology in this country but if you look at the uh, it took at least 40 years at least 20 years of the discussions uh, with various sectors with the government Uh, in 2004 we had no we uh, at least began the journey at the government level but even then we we have we have only reached the 2 percentage of the land you now of cultivated land in india it's it's under organic and uh, maybe there are more uncertified land in india but number of farmers i think we are first in the world it is also because we have the, it's a, a small number of you know, the large number of farmers with the small holdings so that is mainly the rainfed regions and the, not in the re- irrigated regions so irrigated regions have the biggest farmers in this country so these are there are umpteen number of issues we are going through in this country but the agroecology movement is showing the way forward in various ways one is it is empowering farmers wherever you go where ngos work with the agri- the farmers or even the government or uh, small groups working at the panchayat level or village level you will see or organizing around a uh, around an ideology organizing around a system and organizing around it's a, there's a camaraderie which is happening among the farmers also and uh, in some in, wherever the ngos or civil society csos are involved there's a camaraderie and they create a system which is exactly opposite to the corporate world not or corporate agriculture or corporate thinking or development what what these groups are trying to do is to develop a very sustainable model of development where farmers the environment consumers and everybody benefit it is not it is not it is the profit goes to everybody and it and and, and actually the sustainability the actually the, the word sustainable development is misused by these corporates but whatever happening at, at this level you now by these small small groups all over the country all over the world and uh, that that shows the way we can humanity can go forward if we want The, the 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 other world which is now unfsc research uh, it is corporate uh, agenda which is pushed by the un now which is going to destroy the world more and more and the climate change and the covid everything now we are hit by that and most of the people who are uh, except ex- and most of the industries except the, i think the agriculture uh, is collapsing so that is where now the interest in the last two years or the last four or five years you see there is more interest coming in agriculture because everybody realizes that this is the way this is where we they can invest and this is where they can make profit more and more so what what do you do you actually disempower the farmers more and more and what do you disempower the you actually miss uh, uh, like um, um, uh, create more uh, pr work among the consumers or you get the governments to uh, you be your pr agencies and you make policies you know that like for example the last uh, to at least 2 3 months we have we have been in this country discussing about fortification mandatory fortification of our food and uh, for what this is to this is to improve the nutrition you know and uh, while the agroecology groups wherever they are working we have understood we have realized that agroecology the diverse kind of cropping systems not only just plants the animals the milk everything together actually can address our nutrition security as well as the ecological security of that region or that agroecological region so it is a basically a decentralized approach it is coming from uh, it is like a bottom up approach it is from the land 
to, to the back to the lab. You know, that is the approach we are talking about. And you need a lot of resources there. But if you watch, uh, Ramu was presenting the resources which is now coming into the, which is very, I think it is additionally small. If you really want to address climate change, if you really want to address the genuine food security of this country. But the problem is you now that when, when we were hearing for the first time about this UN uh, Food System Summit, we thought that at least some of us thought that maybe there is some discussion that will happen at, at the agroecology, about, about agroecology, about the local food system at the UN level. But now we realize that that is not the way they are going ahead, which is very, very unfortunate. That is where I think it is like, uh, like during the, I think we have to again strategize our campaign, basically trying to uh, revive the uh, revival resistance inside the country nationally at the uh, grassroots level with the communities, also at the state level and the national level and get more and more people to understand these issues. That is very, very important while we are holding this kind of webinars to address the international issues. But without the, having the local resistance, it is very difficult to actually address uh, the corporate control because corporates are so, in a sense, they are now, uh, unlike the earlier Green Revolution times, we had the public sector with us, so we could actually engage. You know, right now, the, even the Amazon is now coming into the picture, which is the, the next, I, I find very, very uh, nonsensical. You know, why Amazon is selling pesticides? And who is going to regulate? Who is going to control? Now, even now, even with the current system, we are unable to regulate the use of or the misuse of pesticides and the chemicals in the agriculture system. And when we are, you are going to open up all these big, big uh, retail chains into this, uh, whether it is Reliance or whether it is uh, Ambani or whatever, no, uh, Amazon. No. So you, you, it's a global, I think, uh, the disaster which are, which are, which is going to happen for the entire humanity. So that is where I think. It is for our survival. It is for the. It is not just for if you are helping some farmers. We are doing this kind of exercise. The world. If we want to live in this world, you no, know, we we the scientifically we know that the, the global warming is uh, is is in a, it's, it's not a, it's not a myth anymore. It's a, it's we are facing it and we have to find solutions. So and globally, experts all over the world, even the Right Food Commissioner. No, he says that no agroecology is the for, way forward. We can actually increase the production by two to three times, and we can actually help more farmers. And in, in a country like India, with the sixty percent of the farming population, I think we can accommodate. We can give more employment in this sector than in any any industry. Uh, so, but then the power or the uh, the control should be with the at the community level and uh, the panchayat uh, or the state governments. You no, know, should have and agriculture is state subject in India. And uh, the fact that they have not, the central government has not discussed uh, the, this uh, UN's uh, this thing with uh, actually with the state governments itself is a huge problem. Uh, so, government, I, I don't think many state governments are even aware of it. So, I think it's uh, our our. I, I think after this way, I think our future work, I think, should be to with the state governments to make them understand the issues uh, or the larger issues behind this. And I am sure many state governments will be. Uh, at least part of them, at least some of them within the government will be joining with us. And this is the only way I think uh, we can move forward on uh, to to have a, to address climate change and to maybe the future pandemics also. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Isha. Uh, in fact, you brought in uh, climate change, which is uh, really already impacting on the farmers. I was talking about Karnal, where I'm actually working at the moment in Kuchetra, Panipat, uh, the whole Karnal zone. Uh, they, they, this is a bowl like uh, situation, you know, Karnal, that particular area. So, a lot of areas got flooded and they were this time flooded for 30 days altogether. Yeah. The standing crop got destroyed. And in fact, in the insurance system at the moment, if at the, that stage uh, crop gets destroyed, the farmers do not get uh, any damage because also it was only a small portion which is about 30,000 hectares out of the total area. That so, But as a result, no compensation possible, no insurance possible. And this yeah. is the farmers with whom I had the farmer field school uh, meeting and I'm describing their problem. So you need a lot of public investment to deal yeah. with, the, yeah. uh, you know, to support the farmers. My farmers are yeah. certainly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, knowledgeable. They can take many of those uh, decisions. But public investment, collective support is also very much needed. That's, I think, the lesson that we can draw out of it. And I hope we will discuss this particular point more. And I think Dr. Som Marla, Usha, we will take it back. We will uh, yeah. come back, Usha, on these yeah. issues again.
Dr. Som Marla uh, is there with us. Uh, 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 Dr. Som Marla, principal scientist from Indian Council of Agriculture Research. Uh, he's also the AIPS and SNP desk convener. Uh, uh, Som, yes, please start. Yes. Ten minutes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Dinesh. And good evening, friends. And I would be speaking mostly on the influence of agricultural research in impacting the production systems in agriculture and what are the consequences and what are the crises that we're witnessing and what are all the alternatives we could come up with to the existing production systems. So let me start with it. The next slide, please. Uh, Najiket, if you, if you are co-hosting it, uh, make, make it slideshow so that uh, it can be the larger form. Slideshow, maybe show, show it in the slideshow. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Ask me, maybe you can help. Yeah. Or is Ranjini helping? I think it's Ranjini who's... Uh, yeah, Ranjini, that's fine. Perfect. Huh. Okay, please go to the next slide. Yeah, if you look into the scenario, production scenario, for the last 70 years, starting from 50 to today, the grain production has increased. Go back, please. The grain production has increased, actually. Please, could you go back to the last slide? Previous slide, you mean? Huh, yeah. Could you go back to the last slide? Oh, previous, previous slide, slide, the first one. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, if you look at the grain production, it has virtually increased by six times, actually, from 50 million tons to... Please please hold on to first slide. Don't change so fast. Please, I have some data. Please go to the previous slide, please. I'm not changing, sir. Uh, yeah, okay, which ma'am. one would you want? Yeah, Yeah, this is the one I want. Yeah. Okay, if you look at milk, or if you look at fruits and vegetables, or fish, well, they all increased multifold, actually. And... The irony is that hunger remains. How could it be? Because there is a plenty of production on one side and there is hunger on the side and also farmers are struggling, they're committing suicides and they are hesitating. And the consumers, if you compare the prices, consumers are paying in supermarkets from the last 10 years, they have virtually doubled actually. In the case of vegetable oils, they even increased by 250% actually. So, and also who is benefiting is the traders and the big business. That's what we call it as agro-business. And next please, madam. Next slide, please. Ranjini, uh, shift to the next slide, yeah. Soma, yeah, please continue. Yeah, yeah. And uh, while we have excess of production, it is ironic to note that 80% of rural India is dependent on right to food, that is, subsidized food distributed through PDS. So the alternative solution the government is now suggesting is grow more food, take more technological help and go for more food production. The same international agricultural bodies like IRI that has brought IR varieties and also these TN1 varieties in 70s and also wheat variety, Mexican wheats by Simit in Mexico. They were all managed by CGIR, consultative group for international agricultural research under FAO. And ironically, these were the organizations heavily funded by Rockefeller Foundation and also Ford Foundation. And now a new partner, Melinda and Foundation has also joined. And 
these are the people who are dictating policies to summit that is going to be held in a few weeks time to come and also to wto in terms of trade in agricultural commodities among the countries so these wto dictates only the prices locally ups and downs and the cost of prices in our supermarkets and all the things they come commodity prices so they first introduced green revolution in 70s and 80s and then followed by gm food that is genetically engineered crops we have seen is bt cotton and and uh, illegal entry of herbicide tolerant brinzal and also maize during the last 5 6 years and also now people are talking about genome editing actually that is shuffling the genes inside the genome itself and so these are the solutions they are proposing for in, increasing the productivity next please so at the very core problems in agricultural systems are remaining and uh, please next slide please so the in the green revolution they proposed the high yielding crop varieties and please go to the last, previous slide please i will tell you when to so because i am talking i need the picture to explain madam please go yeah, to the last no slide. Actu actually there is a lag i am not changing but there is a lag so it Sorry, takes time to stabilize okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Hmm. yes in hmm. our country the puts agricultural institute from icr or pantnagar university or coimbatore university and others they introduced tn1 and ir rice varieties and wheat and similar way the gm cotton and all are introduced so they they are cultivated of course they yielded bumper harvest but the glitch is you have to provide inputs what they need that is high inputs of fertilizers irrigation water pesticides and all the inputs highly expensive inputs unless you provide you will not reap bumper harvest but another glitch is these high yielding varieties they are not recommended on the basis of whether you have a red soil or you have a black cotton soil or you have a dry land or you have a very irrigated delta kaveri or godavari delta area at punjab they are not looking into it what they do is these gm crops for example bt cotton they recommend a cotton variety that is universally accepted starting from africa to america australia to india this there is a universal one size never fits all because there are different soil and ecological systems different rainfall patterns and so we cannot force the ecosystem soil or the raining pattern rainfall pattern of the particular local system to adapt to the new variety that's what they want it actually this is against nature and so that's one of the reasons that we find the crisis in resource management soil has soil health has deteriorated water bodies have polluted and environment is polluted consequently the public health is also emerged that's why i call it as inverted pyramid it is not uh, based on the local soil and ecosystem but it is inverted pyramid mostly depending on the inputs of corporates next slide please and uh, soma be aware of the time also and yes, you yes, have yes. to manage yes yes i am aware of it yes yes so what we are witnessing is there is monoculture means earlier they used it to be next slide uh, they used to be 600 varieties till the end of 70s in the krishna godavari delta area for example 
in rice cultivation. Now you find hardly six varieties that are cultivated, even not even six coming to 2021. Some people say there are around four varieties serving because they're rain fed areas, they're irrigated areas, and they're high rainfall areas. And all these areas, they're catered by only four varieties. And all the other local desi varieties, they have been pushed out. Means the germplasm, local germplasm has been shrunken and the biodiversity has deteriorated. What is the problem arising from it is the new green revolution varieties, they have imported genes and these genes, they filter most of the genes that are responsible for fighting resistance against diseases or pests, local pests in the ecosystem or that could give respectable yields with the available soil nutrients and, and also all these things. So the new varieties became gene poor and also the, the introduction of even Bt cotton into Vidarbha area or sugarcane into areas where what natural water available rainfall pattern is low is and also crops like crops like paddy introduced in Punjab has made too much abstraction of groundwater. So groundwater levels have plummeted and so these are water guzzling crops and they totally replaced the crops, local crops that are much acclimatized to the local rainfall pattern, monsoon system like oil seeds or pulses or millets and these things from Punjab or from Telangana and several other regions in the country. So what is the problem is with monoculture in the scene, the farmers are losing out on nutrition actually. So nutritional deficiency, small nutrition has become a big problem now. And so in a way, the agriculture has turned into agribusiness for the last two decades, especially. So who are the beneficiaries? Local traders and global seed and chemical MNCs, mostly Monsanto, Cargill, and DuPont and others. Next slide, please. So having this situation, what are the alternatives present? The alternatives are, please, the alternative pathways are diversified, integrative, and sustainable production systems using technology. Because I, I would recommend you to use technology, whatever new developments in science, they should be harnessed for human welfare. We cannot ignore them. And we cannot go back to the old oil lamp days and use, but use desi land races, which are having high nutrients and well, they are very adapted to local rainfall patterns and also resistant to pests and diseases. And so for them, you use latest techniques like genome sequencing and genomics for identifying these particular genes and then genes for high iron or genes for zinc for mineral nutrition and also for vitamin A and all those things, which, which we already have it in our local desi varieties, land races. And then you try to combine them and through conventional breeding, you develop the new varieties and also combine both crop cultivation and livestock animal husbandry because they should go hand in hand actually. Too much of chemicalization has brought the present crisis, environmental crisis. And we cannot take away all the fertilizers and also pesticides. Yes, I do admit because we are the second most highest consumers of nitrogen fertilizers in the world, only next to China. And the fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer we are applying to our crops, only 32% is absorbed by the plants. Rest of the 70% nearly ends up as nitrous oxide is 
only next to carbon dioxide and also polluting all the water bodies and it's, this is creating a habit to the environment. So you have an intermix of lesser chemical fertilizers and more of organic fertilizers and take them the livestock, grow more livestock and go hand in hand because now people are realizing that only through agriculture income is not sufficient. They should have beekeeping, they should have livestock, dairy, and they should also have some cottage industries they should have. So this so we should also go for value addition of agricultural produce. Like uh, if you have turmeric, don't sell turmeric, raw turmeric. And from it, there is a compound called cumin, and which could be extracted and which is high priced for pharma industry. Per kilogram, it costs around 25,000 rupees actually. There are small scale food processing units that could be established with the help from ICR and Food Technology Institute in Mysuru with just six, seven lakhs rupees in rural areas. And for rural youth could find employment and also it, it brings some extra profit to the farmers who are cultivating turmeric or some of them. Similar way from extracting vegetable oil from rice brown and other aspects are also there. So next please. So what I would suggest is the agricultural production systems need to be shifted to a localized diversified system where we can have harmony with nature and we can produce food for the local community mostly. And we can go back and we can somehow restore the harmony with nature. And so such production systems to be to begin with the agricultural research system and the education system under ICAR should be encouraged. Now, presently, our annual budget is very poor. This 0.8% of the total agricultural GDP. So that should be increased at least to 2 or 2.5% three times then only we will be able to develop. Uh, so I think you systems. should, uh, uh, you'll have to wrap up now. Yeah, yes, please. yes. Yeah. I'm done with it. So yeah. I support to go for localized, diversified, sustainable agriculture production systems. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please. Najiket, uh, we'll, we'll get back soon uh, in the okay. discussion session. I do want us to have discussion. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Najiket, the next speaker. Yeah, next, next is uh, we have uh, Murugamma, uh, who is with the Savitri Bai Phule Dalita, uh, Dalita Mahila Sangam and a member of the Food Sovereignty Alliance. Uh, Murugamma, Unnara? Uh, Chepandi. Chepandi. Uh, everybody, uh, good evening. Savitri Bhai Pule Dalita Mahila Sangam from Situru. Ante Mako Poro Kalam Law, Avaka Samitu Unde, Adi Ent and Te Kasu Leka, Kasu Ledu, Kasu Leka, Penta Ledu, Penta Leka, Panta Ledu, Panta Leka, Kasu Ledu. E Samatuto, Mem Mudipadi Unamu. E Panta Valana, E Pasuliki, Unna, Manamo Versaim Law, Aneka Rakala. Manam Vasan Chestun Tamu. Chase at Apudu, Pemu, Rekarakala, Ma Dalita Mahila Sangam, Lo Udna Mahilalu, Rekarakala, Tindi Koraku, Memu, Pandistunamu, Adi Ameme, Ante Ragulu, Sajalu, Koralu, Samalu, Vari, Itlanti, Danilutom, Mem Pandinchkoni, Memu, Dintoni, Unamu. Ante Muking a entente, Manakuna, Pasulagani, Edlagani. మన జీవితాలతో ముడిపడి ఉన్నాయి ఎందుకంటే మన వ్యవసాయ రంగంలో మన వ్యవసాయం చేసేటప్పుడు దీనికి మనకి చాలా దగ్గర సంబంధం ఉంది ఎడ్లకి మనము పైరు వేసినప్పటాల నుంచి అది లాస్ట్ అది నూర్పిడి అయ్యే వరకు మనకి ఉన్న ఈ ప్రక్రియ నిరంతరంగా జరుగుతుంటుంది ఎడ్లకు ఆవు కూడా కాకుండా Gorilu, Mekalu, Barilu, 
వంటి పశువులకి మాకు సంబంధం ముడిపడి ఉంది మా ఊర్లో పరిస్థితి పశువులు లేకుండా ఈ రోజులో మా పరిస్థితి పరిస్థితి ఎందుకంటే మా పశువులు తగ్గిపోయాయి మా ఎద్దులు కూడా తగ్గిపోతున్నాయి ఎందుకంటే ప్రభుత్వం తీసుకొస్తున్న పెట్టుకున్న ఒక పద్ధతి పాలసీల సిద్ధాంతం ద్వారా ఈ విధానంలో నడుస్తున్నాయి అది పశువులు జాతి ఎందుకు వాళ్ళు దాని పేరుతోని ఈ పద్ధతులు నడిపిస్తున్నారు అంటే ముఖ్యంగా ఒకటి వాళ్లే ప్రోత్సహిస్తున్నారు గవర్నమెంట్ ఎడ్లకు బదులుగా మిషన్ల ద్వారా వ్యవసాయం చేయడం అది ట్రాక్టర్లు అటువంటి దాంట్లతో ఇప్పుడు ఈ రోజు చూసుకుంటే మా గ్రామ పరిస్థితిలో ఆ నాటు వేయడానికి కూడా మిషన్ వచ్చేసింది అలాంటి సందర్భంలో ఈ మిషన్ల ద్వారా వ్యవసాయం చేసుకుంటే ఉన్న పశువులు మా జీవనోపాధి ఏమవ్వాలి ఇట్లాంటి పరిస్థితిలో ఉన్నాము నెక్స్ట్ పాయింట్ పాడి పరిశ్రమలు అంటే పాడి పరిశ్రమలు మేము పాడి పరిశ్రమలు ఎక్కువగా ఈ గవర్నమెంట్ తీసుకొస్తున్నాయి దీని కొరకు ఉన్న మొత్తం ఈ పాడి పరిశ్రమ కోసమే చూస్తున్నారు అది ఎలాంటి పరిశ్రమ జెర్సీ ఆవులు ఆ పశువులతో ఇక్కడ ఎక్కువగా స్థానిక పశువులు లేకుండా జెర్సీ ఆవులతో పాడి పరిశ్రమలు ఎక్కువ జరుగుతున్నాయి కాబట్టి ఆ పాడి పరిశ్రమలోని మేము ఇట్లాంటి సందర్భంలో ఈ ప్రభుత్వం తీసుకున్న పాలసీలతో మా పశువులకి అన్యాయం కూడా జరుగుతుంది మా వ్యవసాయానికి కూడా మేము దూరం అయిపోతున్నాము మూడ పాయింట్ మేత భూములు మా పరిస్థితి ఏంటి మా గ్రామ పరిస్థితిలో మేత భూముల కొరకు ఉన్న మేతకు ఉన్న భూములను ఇక్కడ ప్రభుత్వం తీసుకొస్తున్న ఒక పాలసీ ద్వారా కంపెనీ ఏర్పాటు చేయడం ఫ్యాక్టరీలు ఏర్పాటు చేయడం అలాంటి ఏర్పాటు చేసినప్పుడు మా పశువులు ఎక్కడికి మేతకు వెళ్ళాలి ఎక్కడ అది మేయాలి దానికోసం కూడా నేను చెప్తున్నాను అది అందువల్లనే మా పరిస్థితి చాలా ఘోరంగా ఉంది పంట మార్పిడి అంటే పంట ఈరోజు పంట వేసుకుంటే ఆ పంట మార్పిడి కొరకు మేము మాకు ఉన్న ఆ ఎద్దుల ద్వారానే మేము పంట వేయాలి కానీ ప్రభుత్వం తీసుకొస్తున్నాయి ఒకే పాలసీలు అంటే ఒకే పంట ద్వారా ఒకే పంట ద్వారా పండించుకుంటే ఆ పంటని మనము మళ్ళీ ఇప్పుడు మేము సజ్జ పండిస్తున్నాము ఒకే పంట పండించినప్పుడు అది మళ్ళీ కోళ్ల పాముకు వెళ్ళిపోతున్నాయి కానీ మా జీవనోపాధి లేకుండా పోతున్నాయి మా పశువులు కూడా మా పశువులు కూడా గడ్డి లేదు అట్లాంటి పరిస్థితుల్లో మా చిత్తూరులో ఇట్లాంటి పై ముడిపడి ఉన్నాము ఎడ్లు ఆవులు విషయంలోనికి ఆ మామూలుగా ఇవి చాలా సంవత్సరాలుగా మాకు వ్యవసాయ రంగంలో గాని మాకు దుఃఖి చేయడంలో గాని ఇట్లాంటి పశువుల ఆవులతో బరిలతో చేస్తుంటాము కానీ ఈ కొన్ని రోజుల తర్వాత ఈ పశువులు ముసిలిద అయిపోతుంది ఆ సందర్భంలో ఆ ముసిలి పశువుని మేము ఈ వాతావరణం సమకాలంలో లేకపోవడం వల్ల ఈ కరువు కీటకాల్లో వచ్చినప్పుడు కానీ మేము ఈ ముసిలి పశువుని అమ్ముకోవాలంటే అమ్ముకోవాలన్న దానికి దళారు దగ్గరికి వెళ్తే కూడా మాకు అక్కడ అమ్ముకోకూడదు అనేసి ఒక ప్రభుత్వం ఒక చట్టం తీసుకొచ్చింది ఆ సందర్భంలో ఆ చట్టం ద్వారా మేము అమ్ముకపోతే మా జీవనోపాధి లేదు అమ్ముకుంటే మాకు సగానికి సగం డబ్బులు రిటర్న్ వచ్చేది ఇట్లాంటి పరిస్థితుల్లో ఈ సందర్భంలో మేము మా పశువులు మా జీవితాలు చాలా ఇబ్బందితో ఉంది కానీ చాలా రాష్ట్రాలు ఏం చెప్తున్నాయి మొత్తం చట్టం తీసుకొని ఆ రాష్ట్రంలోనికి పశువులను అమ్ముకోకూడదు ఇలాంటి చట్టం వచ్చినప్పుడు ఆ రాష్ట్రంలో ఉన్న రైతులు ఎడ్లను ఎలాంటి ఎడ్లను ఎక్కడికి వాళ్ళకి అమ్మాలి ఏం చేయాలి ఇట్లాంటి సందర్భం కూడా ఉంది ఈ ప్రభుత్వం ఏముందో ఈ సర్కారు ఈ చట్టం తీసుకొచ్చిన తర్వాత ఈ ఆవులని అమ్ముకోకుండా మేము ఇట్లాంటి నష్టంలోనూ కూడా మేము వ్యవసాయంలో పశువులు ఎడ్లను ఒక భాగం నష్టంతో ఉన్నాము తర్వాత ముఖ్యమైన విషయం ఏంటంటే ఇప్పుడు అసలు భూమి డెబ్బై ఐదు డెబ్బై ఎనిమిది డెబ్బై ఐదు సంవత్సరం ఇప్పుడు స్వతంత్రం వచ్చింది కానీ ఇప్పటి వరకు మాకు 
మా దళిత కుటుంబాలకి ఉన్న కుటుంబంలో ఉన్న మహిళలకి డెబ్బై శాతం మందికి కూడా మహిళలకి భూమి అసలే లేదు కారణం ఎక్కడ ఉంది ఈ ప్రభుత్వం వల్ల మాకు భూములు కూడా లేకుండా ఉన్నాయి ఆ భూములు ఎప్పుడు లేదు అప్పుడే మాకు ఉన్న పశువులు కానీ ఎడ్లు కానీ దూరం అయిపోతున్నాయి అంటే భూమి లేకపోతే మేము ఎక్కడ కాపాడుకుంటాము ఎడ్లను కాపాడుకోలేము మా పశువులను కాపాడుకోలేకుంటాము దానికి మేత లేదు దానికి ఏమి లేదు కాబట్టి అప్పుడు మా నుంచి దూరం అవుతున్నాయి మా జీవనంలోని భూమి లేకపోతే మేము అసలు జీవించలేకపోతున్నాము ప్రభుత్వం అటువంటిది ఇంకొకటి చాలా ముఖ్యమైనది ఏంటంటే సేంద్రియ వ్యవసాయము పశువులతోని జెడ్పిఎన్ఎఫ్ చేసే రసాయనులక పంటలు కూడా ఇట్లాంటిది మా జిల్లాలో ఎక్కువ జరుగుతున్నాయి కానీ ఒకటే పేరు మీద ఇట్లాంటి వ్యవసాయం చేయడం వల్ల అది ఒక ఎగుమతి ఒక సరుకు లాంటి రూపంలోనే పోతున్నాయి కానీ మా జీవితాలకి అది మంచిది కాదు మేము సేంద్రియ పంటలు పండించుకున్నప్పుడు మాకు మా సావిత్రిబాయి పూలే దళిత మహిళ సంఘంలో ఉద్దేశం ఒకటి ఉంది ఆ ఉద్దేశం ఏంటి మేము పండించిన ప్రతి పంటని మా చేతిలో ఉండాలి భూమి పైన పూర్తి అధికారం మా చేతిలో ఉన్నాయి ఇట్లాంటి ఉంటే మా జీవితాలు ముందుంటాయి మా పశు సంపద కూడా మా చేతిలో ఉంటాయి ఇది లేకుండా ఈ ప్రభుత్వంతో అధికారంతో మా జీవనోపాధి కోల్పోతున్నాము అందుకే మా ఉద్దేశం ఏంటి మా సంఘం ద్వారా ఆహార సార్వభౌమత్వాన్ని మేము కాపాడుకోవాలి మా చేతిలో పూర్తి అధికారం భూమి అస్సలు లేదు దళిత కుటుంబాలకి అస్సలు లేకపోవడం వల్లమే మేము ఈ రోజు ఆ దళితులు అంటేనే కూలికి శ్రమకి ఆధారపడి ఉన్న వాళ్ళు కానీ ఆ భూమి లేకపోతే మేము ఎక్కడ కూలి చేయాలి ఏ శ్రమతో ఉండాలి ఇదే మా ఉద్దేశం ఇట్లాంటి సందర్భంలో మేము మా సంఘంలో ఉన్న ఒక ఉద్దేశం పూర్వకంగా మేము వెళ్తున్నాము అంటే మేము మా సంఘం నుండి నన్ను పిలిచారు కానీ ఇక్కడ మొత్తం ఒక సర్కు రూపంలో చూస్తున్నారు ఒక కంపెనీ ద్వారా నడుస్తుంది ఇది కాదు మేము మేము కంపెనీ కాదు మేము ఒక సరుకు కాదు మేము ఒక దళిత కుటుంబంలో పుట్టిన ఒక మహిళని ఒక మహిళలకు ఉండాల్సిన భూమి హక్కు ఉండాలి భూమిలో ఒక వ్యవసాయంలోని పూర్తి అధికారం ఉండాలి పూర్తిగా మాకు తిండి పైన మా గుప్పిట్లో ఉండాలి ఇట్లాంటి ఉంటేనే మా జీవితం మా జీవితంలో మార్పు కూడా ఉంటుంది మేము మా జీవితంలో మేము బాగుపడతాము ఇంకోటి ముఖ్యమైనది ఏంటంటే ఇప్పుడు ఈ రోజుల్లో జరిగేది మేము ఇవన్నిటి కూడా ఈ కంపెనీలు ఏవై ఉన్నాయో మళ్ళీ చెప్తున్నాను ఈ కంపెనీలు తీసుకొస్తున్న పాలసీలు ఆ కంపెనీలకు మేము ఎప్పుడు వ్యతిరేకత తప్పకుండా చేస్తాము జై భీమ్తో మేము పోరాటం చేస్తాము ఎందుకంటే ఇది మా జీవితానికి ఈ దగ్గర అవుతున్నాయి కాబట్టి మా జీవితాన్ని నుంచి తొలగిపోవాలని నేను కోరుకుంటూ జై జై భీమ్ జై సావిత్రిబాయి పూలే జై భూతల్లి ఈ అవకాశం ఇచ్చినందు ఇచ్చినందు గారు నాకు నా హృదయపూర్వక ధన్యవాదాలు తెలియజేస్తున్నారు మురుగమ్మ ఫ్రమ్ ద దళిత్ ఫ్రమ్ ద సావిత్రి భాయ్ పూలే దళిత మహిళ సంఘం ఐ విల్ ఐఎమ్ సాగరి ఐఎమ్ గోయింగ్ టు ట్రై అండ్ డూ అట్ సమరీ ఆఫ్ మురుగమ్మాస్ అమేజింగ్ ఇంటర్వెన్షన్ ఇన్ ఆర్ సెషన్ Murgama began with a proverb a very popular proverb in her part in Chittur district in Andhra Pradesh which goes like this that without fodder we have no animals without animals we have no uh, manure without manure we have no crop without crop we have no fodder and in this proverb it um, it, it 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 is the metaphor of everything of the in, of the of the composite nature of your life which is people animals land livestock um, crops and fodder and this is the way we have traditionally um, grown our cultivated our crops we've always had animals as an integral part of our of our cropping and the kinds of crops we've grown as crops which we grow for, to feed ourselves it's a diversity of millets it's a diversity of pulses and oil seeds with the primary emphasis and ob- objective that we feed ourselves first but 
because today in our village, we have not even one family today would probably own a pair of bullocks. And I will list out the reasons. And the five most top reasons which Murgamar lists out is number one, the policies of government of mechanization and which continue till today, all kinds of policies, all kinds of financing to ensure that tractors replace animals, that machines replace animals to the extent that today in her village, they also have machines which enable you to sow, replacing human labor. The second is the entire policies to only finance and promote dairying as a privileging dairying over and above all other kinds of this amazing composite multifunctional role of animals, which is not just bullocks, but buffaloes and cows and, and sheep and goat and all kinds of diversity of animals. And today the privileging entirely of dairying. And because we are being encouraged to produce higher and higher milk, again, replacing our own indigenous animals with Holstein Friesens and Jerseys, which of course require that much more investment, that much more fodder. And where the, the males of those animals cannot be used in cultivation. Third is the entire policies to promote monocropping. So today, the, the, the market forces which have forced us into giving up diversity of cropping and the diverse kind of crops that we grow, because once you get into monocrop, as, as Murugama described today, the dominant crop there is bajra, but the bajra goes entirely as as poultry feed and not for consumption, then the use of animals also goes down. The more diverse your crops are, the more work an animal has. And when the animals have no work, then the incentive to keep an animal goes down. The fourth reason she cited was the complete loss of commons. Today, the commons, which were the grazing grounds where you could raise your animals have completely been taken over by government, where they've set up companies and SEZs and factories. So where are we supposed to graze our animals? Because of this, we sell our animals and there are no animals. And finally, the new slaughter acts, which have come in in various states, because once an animal is no longer productive, can no longer be used, Murugama cites the importance of being able to sell that animal, which is then goes for slaughter. But when you can't sell that animal, because today you have slaughter acts in various states, which prevent you from selling those animals, which would indeed have given you, in fact, half the amount or half the rate of what you would would have purchased your animal, then there is again, there is no avenues for you to sell your animal. And therefore, the way we as farm as as farming communities and farming families think is then what do we do with those animals. And coming to the most important point today, I am from a Sangam, which is Dalit women Sangam. Today in our country, the maximum number of landless people, there's still something like 50% and nearly 80% of Dalits in our country are landless. I'm a landless woman. The majority of the members in our, my Sangam are all landless. Until we have the, our control over land, until genuine land reforms is underway and Dalit women like us have control over the land, where is the question of us owning animals? Where is the question of us growing our crops? All we do today is that it is our labor. The majority of labor today in farming is Dalit women's labor and we have no control over land. And coming to my state, there's a lot of talk here in my state about ZBNF and organic farming. And the, 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 the ZBNF today being employed has absolutely no space of animals except for dung and urine. Mechanization continues to be promoted. ZBNF is only directed at producing commodity crops for exporting out of our village. And this kind of commodity production of agroecological farmed produce is of absolutely no use to us because Someone like ourselves, lay, Dalit women like ourselves, whose livelihoods, we have no land and are, are dependent on our labor, where there is the question of us ever being able to afford to buy that kind of organically ZBNF produce, which is going to then just become a commodity and priced right out of our purchasing power. Therefore, in our Sangam, our fight, our struggle is number one, control for land, and the land movement has, and the struggle for land has to continue till we as Dalits have genuine control and rights and title to our land. There is no question of us doing anything else in this entire issue of, of farming. Our labor just becomes alienated, exploited labor. 
Secondly, our Sangam's fight is for food sovereignty, and it is about growing food to feed ourselves, where our control is over our land, our control is over our seed, our control is primarily about growing food to feed ourselves, and then to sell it in our local markets. And therefore, when we talk about food sovereignty, it is about building our resilience, building our control over this system of food, including the, the fact that food goes into local markets. Today, when you talk about ZBNF, you talk about organic farming, you are treating us like another commodity or a link in that value chain. We are not commodities. We are people struggling for our control of our land. Jai Bhim, Jai Savitri Bhai Pule, Jai Bhutali. Thank you. That's Murugamma's speech in short. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sagari. I think uh, you really... Uh, got uh, Murgamma to uh, not only intervene and your translation, uh, what it has communicated, uh, has really added a lot of value to the session. And uh, I think I'm sure there would be discussion at the end, but the challenges of integration of crop and livestock have been very well brought out. How they relate to uh, controlled grazing, for that the commons have to be revitalized, and the other challenges which uh, you have brought out for what purpose we are trying to achieve food sovereignty and food security, as well as the uh, labor uh, livelihoods. Uh, thank you. Uh, Nachiket, who is the next speaker? Uh, Vijayji. I think Vijay was. Uh, uh, Vijayji, your turn hai now. दिनेश जी नमस्कार नमस्कार आज के इस महत्वपूर्ण चर्चा के अध्यक्ष डॉक्टर दिनेश जी और मैं इस संस्था को भी बहुत-बहुत धन्यवाद देता हूं कि उन्होंने मेरी मन की बात कहने का मौका मुझे आज आप सबके साथ में दिया है अभी हम हमारे देश का 75वां स्वतंत्र वर्ष मनाने वाले हैं उसके प्रोसेस में हम हैं और 75 साल का स्वतंत्र होने के बाद में हमारे प्रधानमंत्री ये बड़े भूषण से कहते हैं कि मेरी सरकार 85 करोड़ लोगों को मुफ्त अनाज देती है अब 75 साल के स्वतंत्रता के बाद में 85 करोड़ जनता को मुफ्त अनाज या एक रुपए दो रुपए किलो अनाज पे अगर हम जिंदा रखते हैं तो इसका हमको अभिमान होना चाहिए या इसके हमें शर्म आनी चाहिए जरा इस पे भी हमको गौर करना पड़ेगा और अभी मेरी जो बेटी ने बात की है जय भीम उसको उसने बहुत ही कम शब्दों में यह सब चित्र देश का हमारे सबके सामने नंगा कर दिया है मैं यूनाइटेड नेशंस में अब ये इसमें चर्चा क्यों हो रही है तो इसको एक वाक्य में मैं यह कहना चाहूंगा कि किसानों की लूट जो उपनिवेशवाद में कॉलोनियलिज्म में होती थी वही लूट की व्यवस्था यह नए उपनिवेशवाद में नए आर्थिक नीति में 90 के बाद में ग्लोबलाइजेशन लिबरलाइजेशन प्राइवेटाइजेशन में न्यो कॉलोनियलिज्म में और मजबूत की गई है और उसी व्यवस्था पर यूनाइटेड नेशंस काम करना चाहता है उसको अधिकृत करना चाहता है इससे ज्यादा और कुछ नहीं है ये मेरे जैसे सामान्य व्यक्ति का मत है शायद मुझे ज्यादा समझ नहीं आती होगी मुझे ये लगता है कि सब लोग हम बात कर रहे हैं मैंने सबका सुना बड़ा अच्छा लगा मैंने हमारे देश की चर्चा जो 12 अप्रैल को हुई उसको भी सुना उसमें सब लोग थे उसमें रामू भी था उसमें शिराज हुसैन जी भी थे परंतु मुझे ये समझ में सब बातें बहुत अच्छी-अच्छी कर रहे हैं पर किसान की मजदूर की हालत दिनों दिन खराब क्यों होते जा रही है अभी हमारी बहन डॉक्टर राजेश्वरी ने उनके पूरे प्रेजेंटेशन में बहुत ही अच्छी बातें कही है पर हम उसको कितना महत्व देंगे मुझे समझ में नहीं आता उन्होंने एक वाक्य का इस्तेमाल किया कि लेबर एंड वैल्यू इज नॉट रिकॉग्नाइज्ड उसके बाद में जो हमारे एक आईसीआर के अधिकारी शास्त्रज्ञ ने बात की उन्होंने भी फार्मर्स इनकम की बात कही डॉक्टर स्वामीनाथन जो हरित क्रांति के प्रणेता माने जाते हैं उन्होंने फार्मर्स कमीशन के रिपोर्ट में भी यह लिखा 
कि एग्रीकल्चर ग्रोथ शुड नॉट बी मेजर बाय हाउ मच प्रोडक्शन इज इंक्रीजिंग बट इट शुड बी मेजर बाय हाउ मच इनकम ऑफ फार्मर इज इंक्रीजिंग हम इस दिशा में क्या करने जा रहे हैं नचिकेत ने शुरुआत में कहा कि एनवायरमेंटल फ्रेंडली एनवायरमेंट को बचाने वाली खेती अब क्या जेनेटिकली मॉडिफिकेशन सीड का करके और उसका इस्तेमाल बढ़ाकर एनवायरमेंटल फ्रेंडली खेती हो सकती है क्या आप देखिए जब बीटी कॉटन इस देश में इंट्रोड्यूस किया गया उस समय उसकी वकीली इस तरह से की गई कि बीटी कॉटन के कारण पेस्टिसाइड का यूज कम होगा और एनवायरमेंट को भी फायदा होगा और किसान को और उपभोक्ता को भी फायदा होगा तो बीटी कॉटन को प्रमोट करने के लिए यह लॉजिक दिया गया और दूसरे ही स्वास्थ्य में यही लोग जिनेटिकली मॉडिफाइड हर्बिसाइड टॉलरेंट वैराइटीज की बातें करते हैं राउंड अप रेडी कॉटन की बात भारत में की जाती है जीएम सोयाबीन सीड की बात की जाती है जीएम मेज की बात की जाती है कि जिसमें विडिसाइड का यूज बढ़ने वाला है अब विडिसाइड ये क्या कार्सिजोनिक नहीं है विडिसाइड ये नेचर और ह्यूमन के लिए घातक नहीं है तो डबल स्पीक जो है इस सब इसमें ये बहुत स्पष्ट है सब बड़ी बड़ी कंपनियां इकट्ठा आ गई और नई भी आई तो वो तो लूटने के लिए आने वाली है ना मुझे ये कहना है कि राजेश्वरी जी ने एक बात पे बात कही और इसके पहले सुबह का जो सेशन हुआ जिसमें शालमली जी थी और दो और हमारे साथी थे उन्होंने भी जो बात कही मुझे ये लगता है कि सिर्फ फूड की सोवर्निटी की बात नहीं है ये अनाज सिर्फ नहीं है इसके साथ में और बहुत चीजें हैं अब हम फूड सोवर्निटी में कार्बोहाइड्रेट्स की बात सिर्फ नहीं करते हैं तो अब न्यूट्रिशन की बात भी करते हैं अब न्यूट्रिशन कैसा मिलेगा मुझे ये समझ में नहीं आ रहा अभी मेरी बेटा ने जय भीम वाली ने जो कहा अरे क्रय शक्ति ही लोगों की नहीं बढ़ रही है गांव में और असंगठित क्षेत्र में तो वो न्यूट्रिशियस फूड कहाँ से खाएंगे भले ही हम उत्पादन बढ़ा दे ऑर्गेनिक का और न्यूट्रिशियस फूड का क्या होगा एक तरफ हम किसानों को उत्पादन बढ़ाने की बात करते हैं और दूसरी तरफ हम इंपोर्ट करके उसके दाम गिराने की भी बात करते हैं पाम ऑयल की भी बात यहां पर हुई अब देश के मेरे ख्याल से कई लोगों को यह मालूम नहीं है कि हम मार्केट में तो पाम ऑयल खरीदने नहीं जाते हैं हम मार्केट में सरसों का तेल खरीदने जाते हैं मूंगफली का तेल खरीदने जाते हैं सैफ्लोर का तेल खरीदने जाते हैं सनफ्लावर का तेल खरीदने जाते हैं लिनसीड ऑयल खरीदने जाते हैं जवस मस्टर जी जवस जो लिनसीड है जिसको फ्लैक्सीड ऑयल करके उसके कैप्सूल बेचे जाते हैं अमेरिका में गिनेश जी और मेरे सब साथी जो सुन रहे हैं हमारे विदर्भ में तो गांव का आदमी वही तेल खाता था जवस का वो ज्वार खाता था आज हमारे एरिया में 40 परसेंट ज्वार होती थी उन्नीस सौ सत्तर तक के आज एक परसेंट भी ज्वार हो नहीं रही है अब ज्वार नहीं है रेनफेड एग्रीकल्चर में तो फाडर नहीं है फाडर नहीं है तो जनावर नहीं है जनावर नहीं है तो फार्मर मैन्यूअर नहीं है और फार्मर मैन्यूअर नहीं है तो सिर्फ केमिकल फर्टिलाइजर यूज कर रहे हैं तो कार्बन कंटेंट ऑफ सॉइल माइक्रो न्यूट्रिय ऑफ सॉइल कम होते जा रहा है मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि हम हमारे देश में भी एग्रीकल्चर को होलिस्टिक कर देखकर पॉलिसी तय कर रहे हैं क्या हम हमारे यहाँ पर वही नकल कर रहे हैं जो यूरोप और अमेरिका में हो रहा है और वहां का ही रिसर्च लाकर हम यहाँ किसानों पे थोप रहे हैं मैं बहुत गंभीरता से यह बात कह रहा हूं जब बीटी कॉटन की बात अभी यहाँ पे कही गई अमेरिका में तो बीटी कॉटन का हाइब्रिड सीड नहीं है मैं कई सालों से यह मांग कर रहा हूं कि भारत में बीटी कॉटन का सिर्फ हाइब्रिड सीड क्यों है वो स्ट्रेट लाइन का क्यों नहीं है स्ट्रेट लाइन की वेराइटीज सरकारी संस्थाएं आईसीएआर और कॉटन रिसर्च इंस्टीट्यूट और सब यूनिवर्सिटीज क्यों नहीं स्ट्रेट लाइन में बीटी लाती है अगर वो ले आती तो मोनसेंटो की मोनोपली बायर की मोनोपली और बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियों की मोनोपली खत्म हो जाती थी ना पर नहीं उस तरह से हम इन कंपनियों का विरोध नहीं करेंगे मुझे इसका भी कारण समझ में नहीं आता है ये कारण मुझे कोई समझा दे तो समझ में आएगा मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि हम जो आर्थिक नीतियां डब्ल्यू और आई और वर्ल्ड बैंक के दबाव में देश में चला रहे हैं उससे जो गैप बिटवीन द रूरल एंड अर्बन इकोनॉमी बढ़ रही है उस पे भी हमको ध्यान देना होगा और अगर हमको सही में 
फूड सिक्योरिटी और फूड सोवेरिटी की बात करनी है तो मैं एक वाक्य में ये बात कहता हूं कि मैंने मनमोहन सिंह जी के सामने ये बात कही थी कि गरीब को अनाज सस्ता मिलना चाहिए इसमें दो राय नहीं पर गरीब को अनाज सस्ता देने के नाम पर अनाज पैदा करने वाले ने गरीब क्यों रहना चाहिए इसका जवाब कहीं मिलता नहीं है मुझे बताइए कि अगर दूसरे सब सेक्टर में वेजेस बढ़ेंगे तो उतने ही वेजेस रूरल इकोनॉमी में नहीं बढ़ने चाहिए क्या दिनेश जी मुझे थोड़ा माफ करना पर यहाँ वेतन आयोग बिल्कुल कहिए मैं यहाँ पर फिर वेतन आयोग की बात करता हूँ मैं वेतन आयोग का विरोधक नहीं हूँ पर पांचवे वेतन आयोग में अगर 2550 मिनिमम वेज होता है छठवे वेतन आयोग में वो 7000 होता है और सातवें वेतन आयोग में वो अठारह होता है तो क्या इस तुलना में विजय जावंदिया के खेत में काम करने वाले मजदूर की मजदूरी नहीं बढ़नी चाहिए क्या बिल्कुल तो अगर मजदूरी बढ़नी है तो फिर फूड की प्राइस क्या होनी चाहिए गेहूं चावल शक्कर खाने का तेल दालें कपास इन सब चीजों के दाम क्या होने चाहिए और वो दाम अगर मार्केट इकोनॉमी में नहीं मिलेंगे तो फिर ये कैसे मिलेंगे इसके लिए सब्सिडी क्या होनी चाहिए मैं बहुत लंबी बात नहीं कहता हूँ यूनाइटेड नेशन को जो करना है वो तो करने वाला ही है और वो हो ही रहा है सब तरफ किसान की लूट बढ़ रही है अर्बन रूलर की गैप बढ़ रही है हमारे देश के एयरपोर्ट पे आप जाइए वो एयरपोर्ट देखने के बाद में कोई भी ये नहीं कहेगा कि भारत ये गरीब देश है पर मुझे समझ में नहीं आ रहा है कि हम ये कहा जा रहे हैं हम मल्टी नेशनल मल्टी नेशनल का विरोध कर रहे हैं और मल्टी नेशनल को बढ़ावा देने की सब इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसी चलाई जा रही है कल मैं कहीं तो भी पढ़ रहा था कि एक इकोनॉमिस्ट ने लिखा कि मारुति अपनी कार की कीमत तीसरी बार बढ़ाने वाली है अरे भैया वो कीमत बढ़ाने वाली है उसको कॉन्फिडेंस है कि उस कीमत पे उसकी कार बिकने वाली है क्योंकि उसको इकोनॉमी में पैरल सपोर्ट है कर्जा लो और वस्तु खरीदी करो कार खरीदी करो ये सपोर्ट निकाल दो बर फिर देखते बर ये सब मल्टी नेशनल कारपोरेशन टीवी बेचने वाले माइक्रोवेन बेचने वाले फ्रिज बेचने वाले कहा जाते हैं तो मुझे इतना ही कहना है कि अगर किसानों को पूरे दुनिया के किसानों को बचाना है तो पूरे दुनिया की अर्थव्यवस्था में हमको हमारा हक मांगना होगा हमारा बुनियादी हक मांगना होगा मनी सप्लाई में हमारा हक मांगना होगा और मैं सबके लिए एक ही सवाल देता हूं कि हमारे मोदी जी किसानों की आमदनी 2022 में दुगनी करने वाले थे वो दुगनी कैसी होगी मुझे मालूम नहीं यूनाइटेड नेशंस का ये सब पास होने के बाद में भी वो दुगनी होगी या नहीं होगी ये भी मुझे मालूम नहीं पर दिनेश जी 2026 में भारत में आठवा वेतन आयोग आने वाला है एर्थ पे कमीशन विल बी देयर इन 2026 इन इंडिया और जिस तरह से पांचवे छठवे सातवें वेतन आयोग का वेतन बढ़ा है उसी तरह से अगर वेतन बढ़ा तो आठवें वेतन आयोग में फोर्थ क्लास कर्मचारी की तनख्वाह ये पैतालीस हजार रुपए महीना होगी है ना पंद्रह सौ रुपए रोज मेरा सबसे सवाल है कि यूनाइटेड नेशंस में ह्यूमन राइट कमीशन के माध्यम से यूनाइटेड नेशन के प्रेसिडेंट को हमने ये सवाल पूछना चाहिए कि जब भारत में पंद्रह सौ रुपए प्रतिदिन मिनिमम वेज गवर्नमेंट एम्प्लॉय को मिलेगा तो उस समय गांव में हमारी जय भीम वाली बेटी भूमिहीन बेटी को कितना मिलना चाहिए पंद्रह सो नहीं पर उसको कम से कम आठ सौ रुपए तो मिलने चाहिए ना फिर ये आठ सौ रुपए देने के लिए फूड के दाम क्या होने चाहिए देश में और दुनिया में मैं दुनिया में इसलिए बोल रहा हूं कि आज दुनिया दाम तय करती है आज भारत में सोयाबीन को एमएसपी मिल रही है क्योंकि दुनिया में दाम बढ़े हैं सोयाबीन के आठ डॉलर का दाम चौदह डॉलर प्रति बुशल हो गया है आज भारत में कपास को एमएसपी मिल रही है क्योंकि दुनिया में सत्तर सेंट प्रति पाउंड रोई का दाम एक डॉलर तीन सेंट प्रति पाउंड हो गया है दुनिया में खाने के तेल के दाम बढ़े पाम ऑयल के दाम बढ़े ब्राजील में शक्कर का दाम बढ़ा है तो दुनिया में और भारत में फूड के प्राइजेस क्या होने चाहिए और फूड के प्राइजेस अगर उतने नहीं बढ़ाए जा सकते हैं तो फिर फूड प्रोड्यूसर को इंसान की जिंदगी जीने के लिए सरकार के तिजोरी में से क्या दिया दिया जाना चाहिए अमेरिका और यूरोप अगर देते हैं तो भारत के किसानों की सब्सिडी बढ़ाने की बात या इकोनॉमिक सपोर्ट देने की बात क्यों नहीं होती है 
इस पर भी विचार करना चाहिए हम इस तरह से पूरा होलिस्टिक विचार करेंगे तो फूड सोवरिनिटी और न्यूट्रिशन सोवरिनिटी का कोई अर्थ होगा नहीं तो गरीब मुफ्त अनाज या दो रुपए किलो अनाज पे एक नया गुलाम करके इस नई व्यवस्था में मरता नहीं इसलिए जीने के लिए मजबूर होगा नमस्कार धन्यवाद थैंक यू विजय जी इनफैक्ट वेन आई वॉज द प्रेसिडेंट ऑफ द सी एस आई आर साइंटिस्ट एसोसिएशन वेन सिक्स पे कमीशन केम आई अपोस्ट एंड आई वॉज अ अनपॉपुलर लीडर फॉर ऑब्वियस रीजन आई डोंट नीड टू एक्सप्लेन इट एज फार कंसर्न but i said uh, 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 the way the uh, sa- uh, salary uh, were increased by the bureaucrats for themselves as well as uh, the uh, i think it was pathetic in, in fact it was very distressing that the kind of uh, uh, challenge that we faced at that particular point of time uh, that kind of uh, inequality was in fact reinforced and in fact strengthened so uh, i am with you the eighth uh, pay commission in and farmers income commission should be there and in fact we expected uh, from this government which was talking of doubling the farmers income would have set up by now a farmers income commission it has not done it as yet uh, number one number two if you really want to uh, come out of the cheap food uh, paradigm and we, we, which is what we talked in the morning in the session if you recall that that's the paradigm under which uh, uh, the labor is going to be cheap cheap labor cheap nature uh, uh, cheap regulation deregulation these are the three things which the companies are asking for it and this is what the three last stand for cheap for whom that's the issue costly for us cheap for them as far as is concerned so uh, and they make lot of money in this case and i can tell you from the kind of exercise that i'm doing who makes how much money in the agricultural value chain and the results would be really uh, soon out in about a month and a half of that particular area uh, uh, we will bring out cheap for whom and costly for whom as far as is concerned so i think uh, the dimension that we are discussing here has so many facets that uh, uh, if people want to come back i in my chair i do not have the right to arrogate to myself more time i, I just wanted to join you in this particular uh, point that yes eighth pay commission uh, before that they should actually have a farmers income commission that's what uh, our demand should be and that's what uh, has to be the case so uh, if uh, nachiket if we can take 10 12 minutes of conversation and i think if uh, that might be possible other than that uh, i don't think we have time and uh, 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 whether uh, uh, you know uh, uh, ramu uh, would you that uh, raji do you want to say something at this stage make an interjection before you leave is Ra- uh, dr rajeshwari is there or not or she's probably left for uh, she wrote to me in the, by that uh, message to me that she has to leave for the session spine treatment session which she is having because uh, uh, that's important i told her that in case you have to leave you ah, rajeshwari is here oh good Ra- raji if you want to make a, a minute or so interjection please uh, 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 before you leave for your session Uh, yeah no i'm actually that. on the way i'm actually on the way I'm, i just i just want to say that that one i mean that the 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 relationships it is the way i mean i really like like the presentation that murugamma made which sagari tra- translated for us so i did follow it to the telugu but you know i mean the, the kind of relationships that 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 this whole economy is built on that is not just economy social and ecological relationships are built on that is what the state doesn't understand that is what this unfss doesn't understand and i think we have a big responsibility here to make sure that these relationships that is these patterns of relationships are sustained the kind of relationships that murugamma spoke about i think i just stop with that and with that a lot of these problems when what jivendra jivendra ji said about about wages about incomes you know why should we have poor people and then redistribute them why can't we just not have poverty where people can produce and consume things that they want i mean where the landless workers get work and can feed themselves so it's the relationships that coming back to murugamma's point about building sustainable relationships building locally adapted pra- practices and good relationships that is what's crucial i'll stop here thank you very much dinesh thanks no raji Everybody. thanks uh, i agree Namaste. with you that that's what i think bjj also Namaste. means that's what Namaste. also bjj means uh, ramu would you like to come in at this particular stage and uh, 
uh, make a point for uh, uh, reflection and we, maybe we won't be able to discuss it all together but ramu you uh, if you have a point to offer and for uh, further conversation please do ramu are you around with us i think ramu is not there dr raman janelu uh, dr som marla yeah i want to touch two points yeah one please soma one rise by moragamma is very valid that is unless we bring structural changes in land ownership in rural india and the food production system cannot be changed entirely pro nature actually that's what she said i very much appreciate and and unfortunately in the farm laws three farm laws that are enacted there is no place for agricultural labor at all and not talking about wages for the agricultural labor then though they are the part of production system but they don't have any say anywhere actually that's the second thing is vijay ji has raised jo hamare paas varieties kyun nahi hai why we don't have varieties like in hybrids here wo bhi icr se kyun nahi aa rahe that i would like to say that way back in 2008 in instead of genetic engineering and introducing a foreign gene into cotton plant and making it a hybrid where season after season farmer has to go to market and buy for the crop the icr has developed a variety called bikaneri nirma actually ye bikaneri nirma variety hai ye darwad ki krushi vigyan विश्वविद्यालय से बना हुई है और नागपुर में जो हमारे रिसर्च स्टेशन है ये दोनों मिलके बनाए हैं लेकिन जो मॉनसून के वाले ने ये एक बदमाशी की है जो हमारे डिमोनिस्ट्रेशन रिसर्च प्लान प्लॉट्स है उसके अंदर जान पूछ के ये अपने हाइब्रिड्स ला के उसमें फोर्सफुली प्लांट करके और वो गवर्नमेंट के विजिलेंस लोगों को लेके दिखा के दे शोड दैट लुक दीज आर दाइरेटेड सीड्स ऑफ फॉर मॉन सेंट्रो सीड्स दीज आर नॉट दिजिनल आईसीआर डेवलप्ड वेराइटी अगर हमारी वेराइटी होती तो ये एक ये वेराइटी को चार पांच साल तक छह साल तक यही बद्र करके मतलब सेव करके किसान यूज करते था मतलब जो मार्केट जाने की जरूरत नहीं था जो मॉनसेंटो की जो फ्रॉड है ये हमारे आईसीआर को बदनाम किए इसलिए जो वेराइटी हमने डेवलप किया हाइब्रिड के जगह में ये इसकी ये कहानी यही था ओके थैंक यू Yeah, so much thanks, but I think Vijay ji wants to make a small interjection, and then yeah. Raj Shekhar, Nawaz, or anybody else uh, wants to come in. Please do come in. Yeah. Hey, मुझे सिर्फ इनको इतना ही कहना है कि actually I was part and parcel of that Bikaneri Bt Narma. Doctor Kranti से मेरे बहुत नजदीक के संबंध थे, और Doctor M S Swami Nathan ji के intervention के कारण ही Bt Cotton Bikaneri Narma was released. and then what he is saying is right ki wo baad mein sab seed companies ne milke usko badnam kiya ki usme jo gene hai wo monsanto ka hai aur isliye uska patent hai par main aapko batana chahta hu mananiya mahoday ki uske baad mein modi sarkar se maine patra vyavhar kiya aur mujhe modi sarkar se ye jawab aaya ki bt cotton ke upar ka bolgar one par ka patent khatam ho gaya hai aur hum kar sakte hain और उसके बाद में 2016 से अभी तक के 10 भी वैरायटीज नहीं आई है स्ट्रेट लाइन में और 1000 से ज्यादा वैरायटीज हाइब्रिड में अलग अलग कंपनियों के मार्केट में है मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि कहीं तो भी ये जो आपने सही कहा कि ये बड़ी बड़ी कंपनियां सरकार को भी मैनेज कर रही है पर उसमें हम लोग भी कम पड़ रहे हैं जो इन कंपनियों का विरोध करते हैं वो भी कम पड़ते हैं कि सरल स्ट्रेट लाइन की वैरायटी अगर किसान को मिलती तो मोनोपोली नहीं चलती आप बिल्कुल सही कर रहे हैं कि किसान उसको चार बार छह बार यूज कर सकता था पर ये एक बहुत बड़ा गेम प्लान है हाइब्रिड में देने का भी परंतु इसका जवाब नहीं मिलता और हम किसान छोटे उसमें बहुत कम पड़ जाते हैं और हमारे देश के कई एनजीओ भी सिर्फ बहुराष्ट्रीय कंपनियों का विरोध करने की सुपारी लेते हैं पर वो किसान उनके हित की बात नहीं करते ये भी एक दुर्भाग्यपूर्ण वास्तविकता है uh there's uh, so ma uh, 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 before uh, you, you, if you just want to join but it's smaller interjection 
so that yes. some others can so also be brought so in. Yeah. Small intervention. आप सच बोले दो हजार सोलह से अब तक ये पांच साल में वेराइटीज ये रिसर्च बहुत कम हुई है कारण ये है कि हमारे जो रिसर्च एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर्स हैं जो डायरेक्टर हैं ऊपर के जो लोग हैं वो सुनते हैं सरकार की बात सरकार भी ये कंपनियां की मानसून टू इनकी बात सुन रहे हैं हम पर इतना दबाव है कि जो हमारे इच्छा से जो लोकप्रिय जो प्रॉब्लम है उसको लेके हम रिसर्च नहीं कर पा रहे हैं हमारे पास इंडिपेंडेंस नहीं है Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Soma. Uh, Soma ji is uh, very much involved with the plant genetics, also. You know, he's one of the leading scientists. So uh, he yes. just Correct. retired, actually. So uh, uh, from ICA, uh, uh, friends. Uh, uh, if Nawaz or Raj Shekhar, anybody else, Usha ji, Usha, are you still around? You want to make any uh, make a point? Yeah. No, uh, I think uh, uh, that what Murugamma was saying. No, that the resource. the control over resources i think is the most important for uh, farming to continue in this country you know especially for the small and marginal landless farmers and it is taken away for various reasons you now uh, even by making agriculture economically unviable people are moving away from farming so the country has to decide whether where we want to accommodate these people you know the rural people you now whether they want the rural people to be in farming or some other occupation you no know? so there is no there is you no know, without any planning they are just pushing farmers out of agriculture by purposefully so that they can the corporates can take over that land so that is where and uh, 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 the recent you know the pandemic has shown that the rural people is better for them to be in the rural areas if they have some you know livelihood possibilities so that they can be with their families their cultures their food everything you now that is where you know, the importance of the local development and the r&d has to be at the local level it cannot be at the icr delhi or the national or even state level so r&d has to be at the grassroots and the icr education system has to change now because these people are now the, the younger generation they are they want to work with the corporates not with the farmers you know so they are they want to become the part of the supply chain you know all those very few are you know coming out and then working in the field so it is also based because of the education system which they are receiving so that is where no where, where we want to the nation has to decide where we want to go from here no whether they want to support the people or the corporates they have to be no that they have to tell us the government have to tell us then we, then because otherwise no they are it's kind of a game they are playing around the people's lives and all our lives uh, and in the name of development or whatever no bringing Uh, all this kind of, and the, they use the same words the sustainability all this kind of stuff but they have a, another plan so and the the msp i think is a must there is no there is no uh, whether no they cannot go, go back on that and we cannot go back on that and uh, secondly the agroecology is very important but for agroecology <clears throat> to happen the control over resources is important and also the women farmers i think that is i think very important which uh, i think we did not touch upon and uh, i think that uh, the I touch, think because usha Makan usha you can take a heart, yeah. take a minute uh, uh, touch the women, gender dimension yeah please do yeah yeah i know i, I think now that is why you know the uh, women farmers i think they are the my, main producers now especially food crops especially in the rain fed regions and uh, uh, and they, i think the support to the especially on the land they don't have the land with them and they don't have the technologies with them no because most of the technologies are for men farmers so uh, that's what the r and d at the grassroots level which is also you no know, many farmers small farms need different kind of machinery not this kind of combine harvesters and then tractors and those kind of stuff so that is why you no know, the icr system is not upgrading itself to take care of all these needs at the grassroots level now which is gender which is even young people you no know, how do you how, how do how you can actually keep the farmers children in their farm and they can actually sustain they, they can make a sustainable livelihood in their own uh, in their villages you no know, so though i think it's very important to discuss uh, this kind of uh, because we have to uh, what is development you no know, that's ultimately that is the question whether it is people's development or whether it is some infrastructure development so and where icr system is today in that on especially because agriculture is one of our main industry in that sense 
Uh, it is true. It is very true. Agriculture is our industry, and uh, no doubt about it. That's how it should be taken. Yeah. All right. I want to. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Usha. Uh, any other friend who's uh, there in the uh, box uh, in the room here? Uh, Ranjini, Rajshekhar, uh, 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 anybody? Uh, welcome. Before we, uh, I make closing remarks, and Nachiket uh, closes uh, makes his closing remarks. Yeah. Ramu is back. Ramu, uh, I see you. Uh, you yeah. left. Uh, you're back. No, no, no. no I'm here. Yeah. yeah, Ramu, please. Yeah, please, see, one uh, of uh, one of the important thing is about uh, when we talk about alternatives, the resistance from ICR uh, and agriculture universities is something we need to deal with. Uh, that is uh, because we were, uh, for the last two years I was talking to ICR uh, through various universities to introduce courses, but ICR is absolutely negative and then they are not allowing for any change in the course curriculum. And uh, I think that is very, very critical because if you are manufacturing uh, consent only for chemicals and then uh, people, are, they don't even understand what we are talking about as agroecology. So I think this negotiation at the national level on the, and then breaking this monopoly on uh, the, the form of science which they talk about, I think is very important. Uh, I think that is a critical thing. I agree with yeah. Ramu. Uh, he's making a very important point and uh, I've always uh, discussed with him and uh, this is an important challenge uh, uh, for uh, even in the case of nature positive solutions, a uh, lot of research and development, we can't depend only on knowledge which existed uh, because of the co context having changed, constraints having changed, a lot of adaptation and upgrading of the systems uh, would be required. Complete agreement yes. with Ramu that uh, ICR science cannot become subordinated, it should not be subordinated to the corporate aspiration or a high external input system of agriculture whose right. limitations are very, very clear to us at the moment already. Yes. So, any other friend uh, who wants to come in? Otherwise, Nachiket, you and me now have the responsibility of closing the session. And I just want to make two small remarks. As well. One idea which is not come in, which for nature positive solutions is absolutely essential. That's the idea of cooperators. APOs were uh, brought in by Ramu, no doubt about it. But I know the way the APOs are getting set up. They are getting set up under the leadership of either traders or very large farmers. They are not like social cooperatives of the small and marginal and uh, medium scale farmers and even the local rich peasants as far as it's concerned. That's not how they are evolving. And I, I can give you examples from Himachal Pradesh. I can give you examples from Haryana, etc. That's a subject by itself. And I think we need to discuss because uh, for, uh, when we at in, individual farmer won't be able to take up the challenges of uh, agroecological uh, uh, approaches by him, uh, uh, herself or himself as far as it's concerned. Second, is uh, I made the point with regard to public investment. That's very important as far as concerned. Both cooperatives and public investment together only can create a, uh, 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 you know, a, a not only discursive power, but also bargaining power and institutional power in favor of nature positive solutions. And uh, if one gets into the details of uh, what, uh, like whether even the implement implementation of IPM, the uh, if you take the integrated pest management, why the biological uh, the, you know control was not uh, getting pushed and uh, side management precisely for that particular region uh, also, and uh, uh, this kind of challenge cannot be taken up without also the state getting involved. And if the state gets hooked on to the uh, other side, and rather than being uh, aligned with the social cooperative and the local agenda with Murugamaji uh, brought out, till then I, I don't think we will be able to actually have contestation on the ground vis-a-vis -vis corporation. So when we are talking of multi-stakeholderism, you know, to be contested, where power asymmetry is there. So power of the farmer can be increased either through ki sarkar mere saath hai, you know, the uh, Meher Shah's uh, 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 statement that in the case of MSP, as well as in the case of Pamla, as well as the fact that the, we are cooperatives as far well together. And ICR system also should be with us. So these are many challenges. And if I start talking of very many other areas which we have not talked today, and maybe 
we will talk about them tomorrow the green india mission is a failure precisely because the campa program that is the compensatory afforestation has become a failure only is not even met to 5% of the target because the corporates were not interested that's why it's key sir so what corporates are interested in and what uh, we are interested in is different and i think that particular challenge has to be accepted and this is a conversation which i have been having with the several friends including ramu my friend and i think the battle out here on the ground is very much to build proper social cooperative seek public investment seek reorientation of r&d and directions which are in favor of the Uh, actually, nature positive solution, and I think uh, many more things can be discussed. We will discuss them tomorrow in the other sessions which are there. Nachiket, please, we let's close it. Uh, yeah. Ah, Dinesh ji, बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद संचालन के लिए और आज हमारे साथ जितने वक्ता जुड़े हैं उन सब की भी बहुत बहुत आभार है हम कि उन्होंने अपना समय दिया इस चर्चा के लिए. और जितने दर्शक भी हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं शुरू से उनके लिए उनको भी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और जितने लोग फेसबुक और दूसरे माध्यम से भी जुड़ रहे हैं आ, मैं आखिर में जस्ट ये कहना चाहूँगा कि ये कार्यक्रम कल भी चलेगा कल दो सत्र रहेंगे सुबह का सत्र रहेगा 11 से 1 बजे जिसमें खादी और पोषण के बारे में बात की जाएगी और दोपहर का सत्र होगा लाइवलीहुड्स पे तीन बजे से पाँच बजे तक और उसी में फिर इसका पूरा एक तरीके से कंक्लूजन भी किया जाएगा तो आशा है कि आप सब कल भी आएंगे और आप सबको आमंत्रण भी देते हुए आज का हम यही समाप्त करते हैं धन्यवाद